All right, so. All right. Hey. Karen. Hey. Um. Did you? Benjamin. Yes, Benjamin. Did you? Did you do a? <laughs> did you do a video the other day in in your bathrobe? Yeah, I did. That's so cool. <laughs> that is so cool. Um. Yeah, I I haven't actually had the guts to do that yet. You know, a video in my bathrobe. Well, actually, I have, but it was a gimmick video. Um, but uh, maybe mine was a gimmick. I you don't often, know. I <laughs> I often do. I often do videos in uh, essentially my pajamas. So. Um, yeah, I was wondering about that because it, it is a white cotton thing you're wearing there. There you go. Like a double I, as a it's, I, PJ. I, I live in these 24 hours a day in these tanks. So, <laughs> so it's like I get up in the morning and I look down and if there's no stains or anything, I'm just like, ah, fuck it. And it's all good. I'll be wearing uh, my guy's boxers as shorts because I can't find shorts that fit properly. So mm -hmm. I, just, I just use his boxers and then nobody sees, nobody knows. Nobody knows that I'm yeah. not wearing pants. Well, so. you're always sitting on a couch from your videos. Well, so and plus, you're either that or you're in front of a podium, so... Yeah, usually. But, yeah, I w have to walk up to the podium, so I can't wear underwear for that, but... Okay. Um, but, yeah, okay, so, now that the preamble is done and we've embarrassed each other, um, hello, Benjamin Boyce, uh, okay. the, uh, apparently the voice of reason, and uh, what I Sometimes. wanted... <laughs> what I want... Well, actually, I've watched a lot of your stuff, almost every video and uh, that you've put out on evergreen and uh i really wanted to give you um some bigger exposure as far as uh because i think it's really important your mm. assessment from the position that you were in having access to certain information that not everybody has um mm. and your insights into essentially what led up to what went on at evergreen college um, I think that you deserve, I, I, I think I went on a YouTube saints live stream and they always ask, you know, who's, who's your favorite YouTuber and who do you think is criminally undersubscribed? And I believe I said that you were my choice for criminally undersubscribed. You, you deserve a bigger platform to share your ideas and your information. So that's, that's kind of why, to hear. that's kind of why I, I appreciate wanted, that to yeah. have you on. Um, so just tell me, uh, sort of, give me a quick and dirty as far as um, what your experience has been with Evergreen. How did you, yeah. how did you come to make these videos? So uh, quick and dirty. It's hard to be quick at this point because I've done, I've, I'm coming on like 20 hours of doing this stuff. And, oh, yeah. uh, and it's a very complex story. Um, because what brought attention <laughs> to Evergreen was a series of videos that were released by the um, the student protesters, and they protested and live streamed the whole thing with their you know with their phones up like this, and um, and then put that on Facebook, and they the, one of the first things that they did that with was uh, they went and they protested this uh, humble faculty member called uh, his name is Brett Weinstein right. and they called him a racist and they brought this email that, that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was a racist and he tried to initiate a dialogue with them and that didn't go as planned and um, and then from that they went and they those protesters did a series of protests um, and it was just it was crazy uh, the, the day after they protested Weinstein they took over the library building, which is also the administrative building at Evergreen. And I was in the library just working on my my thesis or my capstone project, my my final right. uh, hurrah at Evergreen. And um, you just hear all this chanting. They started taking like uh, couches and chairs out of the library to position against the the doors because they heard the cops were coming. And they 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 have a they have an issue with police. It sounds and, like um, nothing illegal is going on here at all, right? Yeah. Uh, well, that they say, you know, they say if they 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 have a version of what's legal and what's violent um, that they contest pretty strongly. Um, right. That that shows that certain people saying certain things 
dis disregardless of the tonality or the volume, that's violence. But other people saying other things, dis regardless of the volume or the content, that's that's not violence. Or, or, um, or people maybe barricading doors to prevent others from leaving and stuff like that. Yeah. That's, that's not illegal or violence. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, and there, there's, uh, there's certain unfortunate evidence of them taking uh, certain people hostage, too. Mm -hmm. um, which the 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 president said I, I didn't I felt safe the whole time but <laughs> that's such bullshit. I I don't know but I know that other people that he was you know he was responsible for were not they were not um, yeah. and I've so anyways long, we're doing quick and dirty yeah um, then Brett Weinstein goes on this thing called Fox which is like this news platform it's, it's like um, nobody's heard of it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've tried to tune in, but like it doesn't make any sense to me. So I just kind of tune out. Um, and uh, that was that was a big no, no. So the 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 narrative is that the students posted the videos that brought the attention or Brett brought attention by going on Fox News. And anyway, so attention came down on Evergreen and I was watching all this attention and all this um, all this uh, punditry about the place and interpretation and i i saw that some things were not being talked about and i'd been following um campus protests uh for like a year or two um at the beginning of that year was it 2015 or 2016 so for a couple of years like something happened at yale i think oh, where and some Mizzou. teachers yeah, and, and Mizzou. then Mizzou, yeah. and then Peterson, Jordan Peterson, mm -hmm. um, he got in a kerfuffle with the same thing. And I was, I was watching Evergreen go in the same direction. Right. And I was watching actually it being promulgated by the the administration and the faculty that there's a certain way that the world is screwed up, and there's a certain way to respond to that. And I was seeing how students were responding, and I didn't think that that was okay at all. Right. I saw it building up to the protests. Mm -hmm. And then the protests happened, and then everybody started paying attention and trying to make sense of it. I'm like, okay, I got to start talking. So I just took my camera, and I just started talking about it. And I got attention, so I talked more, and I talked more, and then I started getting um, started getting material to actually talk about. Right. Um, and that's kind of how I started doing this. Right, and you... you you joined uh you you um you became a student at evergreen when you were 36 you said yeah yeah so good you, memory. yeah no you have you have a i do have a good memory about de <laughs> details like that <laughs> yeah, yeah no like what go, going to the store to get milk and getting everything other than milk not so much but um, yeah right <laughs> but for stuff like this yeah i have a good memory but um and you, you did your four years, you graduated sort of the, the spring before the protests or? No, no, it was, I graduated, uh, I guess two weeks after the protest. Oh, okay. All right. Three weeks. So, so it was just essentially, it was like right at the tail end of things. And you also worked at Evergreen um, yeah, I worked. as staff. So you have access. Well, no, 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 no. Uh, as a student. Okay. Um, a student employee. Okay. Right. So uh, part of my financial aid was to get work study. And so I worked in the media department. Oh, okay. And so I was actually on some of the jobs and I've been watching these lectures and these panels where everybody talks about the same from the same perspective, just from different uh, areas of expertise, but really no debate, yeah. no uh, questioning certain assumptions. So I saw that um, and I didn't like that. Yeah. I no, think that's it's, education. It's um, it's. It's essentially like some of the stuff that you've posted uh, in terms of there was one uh, lecture that you or it was a panel discussion that you posted and somebody who was Asian was talking about his experience of being pulled out of class by police along with uh, four or whatever other Asian students. Right. Yeah. And. You know, you can you can say that that's ethnic targeting, or you can say that the police had a report that an Asian male had committed a crime, and so they're mm -hmm. going to pull all of the Asian males out of the class, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, this is not necessarily uh, indicative of any kind of systemic racism or, or racial targeting. Um, you would have to know more about the individual case in order to be able to say whether that was yeah. what was going on. 
And I highly doubt that that's what was going on if they were actually just saying, you know, you, 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 you and you come this way. We want to talk to you because Mm -hmm. we've had a report of a crime. Right. They're not going to just single out, especially if there's black students in the class and maybe white students Mm. with tattoos and facial piercings in the class. Mm. Right. Who look disreputable or whatever. Right. Mm. Um, They're they're not going to just single out one ethnic group for that kind of treatment um, for no reason. It's it's almost always because there's been a description of the perpetrator. But um, and. So I think that a lot of a lot of the rhetoric around all of this stuff is extremely hyperbolic. I I I seem to remember uh like I keep getting reminded of something that Larry Elder, I don't know if you know who he is. He's a black conservative. Um one of the things that he said when he was uh a guest on Dave Rubin's podcast was, you know, my dad always told me that if you're stopped by the police you're you're polite, you're respectful, you cooperate, you do what you're told. If you feel like you're being treated unfairly, you make a complaint later, mm-hmm. right? And uh, because, number one, you don't want to be seen at, by a cop as resisting arrest. And number two, if the cop is actually being racist, he's the last person you should be appealing to. Yeah. Right? You know, like, why are you complaining to this guy who's a racist? when you could be reporting him to his superiors that he treated you unfairly. Right. So, and you know, like to avoid, to avoid getting hurt, to avoid getting in trouble, to avoid being seen as resisting arrest, to avoid getting handcuffed. Right. You just, and this was what my parents told me when you get stopped for speeding, always be polite, always be respectful. It's always served me well, even caught drinking underage always served me well to be Hmm. respectful to the cops and not be belligerent right so i mean i i just so i don't understand this Hmm. this whole idea that this hostility towards the police right and this idea that they are and one of the things one of the things and i'm sorry i'm like monopolizing monopolizing the conversation here but But one of the things that struck me was two of the demands of the Evergreen protesters was that the police completely disarm themselves, mm-hmm. right? But then they, one of the other demands was what, what is the administration doing to keep students safe from other yeah. people coming in off, from off campus? Well, yeah. that's why your cops have guns, you dumbasses, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, there just doesn't seem to be any logic to any of this. Yeah, it, well, yeah, the logic, that's a big, uh, that's that's a whole area of trying to figure out, like, what where is the consistency? Because I do believe that there is a consistency there. It's just manifesting inconsistent, inconsistency constantly um, when you actually, like, think about it. But if you feel along with it, you can see that they're they're operating according to a certain emotional narrative. Right. With regards to the police, it's very, um, that story itself is very um very interesting because they had a new police chief come on Mm -hmm. at the beginning of last year a A female police chief yeah a woman um and she had worked her way up from just dispatch all the way up through the ranks and then she became chief of evergreen police and during her you know her career she went she actually went to evergreen and she interacted with the model and she kind of understood what the students and the culture is like and she would she would have been just the perfect one to have there. Um, and she wanted to make more of a push to to facilitate community relations between the police and the students. And she met um, she met difficulties at every single turn. She was emailed pictures of bacon when she was like inviting people for donuts. she she was treated very unfairly with um with regards to even teachers and faculty i I, i've been going through and getting records from evergreen because it's a state college so i have access to all the through the freedom of information act i get access to all these emails and what i just read yesterday that a couple of police officers went to the media loan department to get a projector and a screen for some in-service that they were doing. And they were interacting with the person working at media loan and 
somehow she figured out that they were police officers and they and that well they this student or whatever began slamming things down and being really curt with them and being incredibly rude and the police of Ch Ch uh, the chief of police heard that and emailed the director of media alone and said like this isn't correct for you know students they're in a position they're they're working there's workplace expectations um she shouldn't be treating police officers like that yeah. and the re the reply was that well some of my students have ptsd and they have problems with the police like going back in their psychology and stuff so if you let us know before you guys come over for something we will make sure that people serve you who won't be triggered by you by your mere existence and that is that's the that so not only do you have students who act like that, but then you have the um, the administration and the staff going along with that. Yeah. And 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 it was very difficult for her. Um, I, well, I know I this from didn't, reading this stuff. Like didn't they disrupt her uh, the ceremony where she was actually yeah. sworn in? Um, yeah. They they and it had to be sort of uh, called off halfway through or yeah. something like that. Yeah, that that's one of the reasons why I'm doing these videos and why I'm I'm kind of keep on doing them. Um, yeah. One to get to get to the bottom of the story and really flesh it out. I think it does tie to what's happening in North America right now with the way that students are acting and what's going on in academia. But being witness to her signing in ceremony firsthand, I was you know in the media department, so I set up all the sound and plugged in all the doodads and got all my <laughs> dongles correctly ordered and. Then the protesters showed up with fog horns, screaming, fuck the police, and getting up into administrators' faces, like snatching microphones, throwing them on the floor, um, uh, getting right up into Stacy Brown, which is the chief of police's face, and screaming and yelling at her with her like nine year old daughter right next to her. Right. And then you have all these people, all these, you know, all these allies, so-called, they come up and they just start eating all the catering food and laughing about this. And it was just, it was totally disgusting. It's, and I'm, it, it's like they're behaving like, chim like chimpanzees, right? Like it, it's almost are, like flinging poo and, you know, yeah. and, uh, and yeah. go into the buffet. I would say toddlers, and, you know. Well, yeah, that. They have. They have certain verbal skills, so I want to at least give them toddler okay, status. Okay, okay, oh, toddler status. But yeah, no, it's it's. I mean, it it is a very, like, because what I see happening in, in North America at the moment is, uh, a massive polarization of tribal, affiliations, right? Hmm. And so I mean, hmm. what we have, and and I have heard from uh, you know a whole bunch of sort of leftist media sources and progressive media sources that that uh, groups like Antifa and by any means necessary, and you know the students at Evergreen, and you know all of these uh, Black Lives Matter, and all of these groups are they are a reaction to the rise of white nationalism in in america but what i have seen because i have been watching this all for the last nine years or so um mm. what i have seen is white nationalism up until maybe a year and a half or two years ago was it was just like it, basement dwellers mm -hmm. you know that they, they got no respect they got no traction in the mainstream whatsoever mm -hmm. and now they're starting to get that because i think that people are seeing what's going on on the far left what's going on with identitarian politics mm -hmm. in terms of this, the particular narratives that, that are being promulgated by academia mm -hmm. and then spread in mm -hmm. media and in, in uh, politics, right? So the white nationalism, they are the reactionaries. It's not, it's not that, that the left is mm -hmm. responding to the rise of white nationalism. White nationalism is rising as a response to all of this, right? And I'm not saying that that's good. I'm just saying they have their causality backwards. Yeah, yeah, no, the they are teaching, and I've I've tried to show this in the videos and the documentation. Mm -hmm. They are teaching a revisionist version of history. Yes, that is antipodal to what uh, what initiated revisionist history. Okay, so there was a time in academia when 
you talked about America. It was this shining beacon. It was a city on a hill. Like we we came to this new land and we you know civilized it and turned all that stuff. it into something beautiful and gorgeous. Yeah. Yes, and a pure yeah, and, we, and and perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not true. No. You know, when, when you look at there's this I was watching, you know, on Reddit, I was watching this gif of America growing, you know, and like how they, they were just naming all these things as if nothing was there beforehand. I'm like, OK, that that's not true. Right. That's not true. There's something they turned it from something. There was an original people there, people that were there before them. Right. And then America came through and, and redefined the territory. Um, and so there is a uh, there's a necessity for us to kind of recognize the the truth of history but what's happening now is that the pendulum is swung to this other this in this completely other direction where everything that the west has done is built out of and on top of racism colonialism is entirely negative um it's just a bloodbath all of history especially all white people have become powerful by subjugation of right. everybody else. And the problem that I have with that narrative is that if you run with that narrative, it's it's entropic, it's nihilistic. You only can conceive of value as something that you take from somebody else. You never are able to create value and or to refine a system. And there's no and, such and, thing as tit for tat exchange. Um, yeah, quick, it's quick, always quick. it's always yeah. just one one person is the exploiter or the oppressor yeah. and the other is the yeah. oppressed and the exploited. Yeah. Um, and what what I find um, what I find most troubling about this is because you have this narrative and it yeah because of the way identitarian politics works it assigns sort of the oppressor oppressed status based on things that don't change hands like skin color and mm. you know and sexuality and gender mm. and all of these things right and so and then they have other sort of sub theories like epistemic privilege and problematization mm-hmm. and standpoint theory yeah. and stuff like that where they say well the the slave in the relationship has epistemic privilege they have a greater insight into how all of this works than the master does mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. they have assigned master status to the whites and now everybody else all people of color or to men and all women right or all non-men right they have epistemic privilege they have the right yeah. to define how the system works. They have the right to be mm-hmm. considered people who should be listened to. Um, and they are, they it's have the, the authority to disregard anything that that man or that white person mm-hmm. says um, about his own, ex- even about his own experience, yeah. right? Because we know better even than you what your motivations and intentions and all of those things are. Because yeah. we are the slaves and you are the master and you never needed to know any of that. We, yeah, yeah. for our survival, Explicit. have always needed to not only know our own experiences intimately, but to know yours as well <laughs> so that we can navigate this world that has been constructed by you. Yeah. And um, so essentially what you have is because we've assigned it to not a, not to things like money um, or uh, <laughs> political power. <laughs> Right. But Mm. to things like skin color and gender and sexuality, how how Mm. do we know when the power has changed hands? We still need to like, what if women, what if women Mm. one day gain the upper hand? How would we know? Right. What's to stop them from saying, well, of course, we'd let you know. We would surely let you know. Right. And we would we would certainly know because we have epistemic privilege. We are still oppressed. You are still the oppressor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and so essentially and, and we guarantee you, guarantee you the moment, the moment we have the upper hand, we will absolutely fill you in. Right. I've never heard them say that, though. But well, I mean, this is what they could. Is that say. implicit? This is okay. it's implicit. Right. OK. They, they right. could say okay. that. Right. That's but good we, to hear. we have epistemic privilege and and with our epistemic privilege, we're telling you that 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 hasn't happened yet. Right. But on, in, and then, in and what then realm, can... in what realm does that operate? Does that operate in a chemistry lab? Does that operate when you're trying to build an iPhone? Does that operate no, no, in your bedroom? No, it just operates. It operates in in this wonky, freaking woo world of 
of the humanities and interdisciplinary studies and uh and it's kind of got its hooks into communications and journalism and yeah, yeah. social Media. work and you know yeah. ev every single yeah. every single faculty every single department of a university where there isn't necessarily a right answer and all the other answers are incorrect so when you got math there's a right answer. Two plus two always equals four. Every other answer is incorrect, right? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. engineering, the bridge either stands or it falls down, right? Yeah. Okay. But when it comes to questions like, is the death penalty something we should have? Or, you know, is abortion a moral act? Or, mm -hmm. you know, morally acceptable? Or, you know, when it comes to questions of subjective experience, right? So when... Yeah. when I, as a, say I'm a minority and I walk down the street and somebody gives me a funny look, right? And I assume, right, because they are a member of the majority, um, I assume that it's because they're racist, right? But then I am unaware, right, that the next person who is a majority, you know, mm -hmm. individual, that person gave them the exact same funny look. Um, because maybe they're mentally ill or something, right? Or maybe mm -hmm. they have a facial tick or, or whatever, right? Or maybe they're just, I mean, I am keep getting reminded of the time I was trying in my head to calculate the price per gram of cheese. I was like dirt poor, trying to buy cheese, different brands of cheese, all sold in different sizes, right? And I want to get the best fucking deal, okay? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, price per gram, price, and so I'm trying to calculate for each of these packages of cheese how much, you know, which one is the best deal? And I'm yeah. doing the math in my head and I'm staring into space, kind of. And then there's this guy who looks up at me and he gets this horrified look on his face. Okay, he's like horrified. And I realize that while I've been staring into space, I've been sort of looking like I was looking and with this frown, right? <laughs> looking as if I was looking at him and he was looking at my ass. Okay. okay. And then he glanced up at like my this face. Triangulation of the yeah. tension. He he glances up at my face, sees me frowning at him, I guess. That's what he saw, right? And he's like, Oh no, she's really offended that I was looking at her ass. And I, it took me a moment to register exactly what had happened. And then I wanted to go running after him into the produce section going, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I don't mind if you, I'm just trying to figure out the price of cheese. Right. But I mean, that's what perception is, is he mm -hmm. thought I was angry at him for looking at my butt yeah. when in reality, all I was trying to do was calculate the price per gram of cheese, cheese. Right. And so a lot of this stuff that is taught in these places doesn't, really rely on hard data it relies on an individual's perceptions of other people yeah. and other yeah. people's intentions and motivations and yeah. so the you know the 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 weird thing and the, the dangerous thing that's happening is that like you said like this stuff is taking root in ambiguous ambiguous situations yes and in complex morally complex situations and matters but how it's being implemented is that it is necessarily leaching complexity and leaching ambiguity out of these very complex issues yes. by by imposing like this right and wrong thing on you know even language uh, i just saw in toronto or the toronto school district has decided that the word chief is a microaggression so they're not using the word chief anymore but if you look at the etymological root of chief it actually comes from like old french or latin meaning the head yeah, right, so, it's, the same, it's the same word as chef. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of chef. Uh, but the, you know, because, it, because this word can be used or has been used derogatorily for Native American people during a certain time, I don't know if that's still used anymore. I mean, I see people calling each other chief in, uh, you know, like maybe on Lost, Sawyer uses that, you know, just like, hey, chief, you know, or whatever, like that. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have a negative meaning. It can have a negative connotation, but they want to use that one word. It's, it's weird and it's simplistic and it's very puerile yeah. to say that this word is evil. And we want to take evil out of the world or like the word, and I'm using quotes, the word retarded. Yeah. Right? The word retarded is evil. So we want to take that 
that word out because we know what evil is and we're going to we're going to dominate the the language and but what's going to happen the meaning of retarded is just going to switch to another another it's, word you yeah, can't it's... stop people from intending certain sorts of meanings and they want to have a totalitarian control over what people can and cannot intend and collapse the complexity of yes. discourse in, in, in such a way that that it will freeze us in place you will no longer be able to have one thing that they don't that they really lack is humor yeah. like like Oh, yeah, being those. able to like to play with things and to not mean something but say it and to release certain sorts of tension and they're they're gonna they're gonna fuck us all oh, if they're, they get they're their winding way. everybody up and it's yeah. you know like when I have uh, I have a friend here in Edmonton um, Nick Redding um, who mm -hmm. uh, he he actually ran for uh, as a gag for city council. A couple of years ago, under the patriarchy party ticket, his his platform was we need more oppression of women, and uh, <clears throat> so and he actually got more than a hundred <laughs> votes. It was he he came in dead last, but he got way more votes than we thought he was going to. Um, but uh, and I think my parents were among the those who because they were in his ward uh, were among those who voted for him just because they found the whole thing amusing. Um, one of huh. his, one of his campaign promises was that by the time he got done reforming the domestic violence services in the province, there would be one bed in the province for men and a dirty dog blanket for women. Right. So you can see how over the top, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, his pamphlets were in it. He even had, you know, a picture of him. He's got his head shaved bald and he's got his fingers tented and he's looking like Holy. essentially like Dr. Evil, right? Yeah, and, Alistair Crowley. Uh, yeah, and so he, so the whole thing was just this huge gag. But um, he <laughs> actually, years before he did that, he put out a video called Niggers, Faggots, and Retards. And it was all about the, the creeping of language and how... He yep. said, he said, well, you know, we used to call them Indians and then that was deemed to be derogatory. So then we had to call them Nate, drunk, Nate, drunk Indians, right? Drunk Indians. That was, you know, so we had to not call them Indians anymore because of the association with drunkenness. Right. Okay. So, all right. So then we had to call them natives. So then people just started saying drunk natives. Right. And then eventually it became First Nations and now, and then Aboriginal and then indigenous. Right. And mm -hmm. same with. You know, um, he said with the 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 evolution of the etymology of uh, for mental disability, you know, goes from mm -hmm. Im imbecile yeah. to moron to cretin to retarded to you know to special autistic now to yeah. special, and then by yeah. the time he started working with them, they were known as clients, right? You know, because he had worked with special needs. Okay. Um, individuals, right? So yeah. they they went from being called retard, retarded, or retards to being called clients, yeah. and but the the stigma is still there. You're not getting yeah. rid of that, and the language will simply evolve to encompass those connotations, whether you like it or not, right? Yeah. And so yeah. the the whole idea of trying to, I mean, it's almost like a German professor once told me that. Uh, that the word uh, Lieben in German, which means love, used to be more, uh, the meaning used to be cl more closely associated with fucking than mm -hmm. with love, right? And the language changed over time, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. essentially you're, you're looking at, okay, so words evolve. They evolve because we need labels for things, yeah. Right. And we will have those labels, even if you take them away from us and say you're not allowed to use these particular words unless the attitudes change. Um, unless people stop needing a label for that, they're going to find a label one way or the other. Yeah. Right. Unless the, um, you forbid the thinking itself. Right. You, well, you can't you cannot. Yeah, you can't you can't forbid that you you want to. I see a an attempt to uh, enforce a viewpoint through language that allows for certain people to judge other people just like they judge people on the color of their skin so it's it's now it's a resurgence of racism and now it's backed by the academy and and it's being backed by the 
litigation people and, and it's getting right. incorporated into law. Um, but you, it, it, it empowers these people in the moment. It gives them a leg up in the moment to, to quash other opinions or to say you're wrong and stuff. But over time, the people who are able to outwit them over time are going to be much more advantaged than the people who have power in the moment. Like with regards to somebody in a class like an Evergreen who is forced to not say their opinion, who is forced because there's a, there's a lot of dialogue at, at Evergreen. And what's right. happening now, I heard reports now that after the protests and stuff, now it's even more instituted that certain people based on their multiple marginalities have control over the conversation right. and are able to shut down teachers, shut down the classroom, direct the way that conversation goes. So you, what you're going to have is people being very quiet, getting into themselves and figuring out all these different ways to deal with these problems, you know, and not having power in the present. But once they're out of the situation that disempowered them, they're going to be much more ready to deal with different adverse circumstances in the real world right. than the people that have the power that are being empowered in that moment. So it's going to absolutely backfire well, because on those, the, in the administration. Those people are not being those people are not empowered in the sense of actually gaining the skills to yeah. to. Uh, have to to have a, a genuine and sincere claim to authority in those situations. Yeah. They're being handed that. Yeah. Um, they, it's they... the 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 so the police chief had all of the responsibility and none of the authority. Yeah. Right. Now these students have all the authority and none of the responsibility. Yes. So it's it's this, uh, and you have to tie those two things together. It's like the word and the meaning. You can change the word, but the meaning's still going to be there. The meaning's just going to find another expression for yeah. itself. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like it reminds me of because I did a podcast. It'll be up, I don't know, in a couple of weeks, um, with a guy from New Zealand just recently. And the whole uh, the whole premise of the podcast was fifteen minutes of softball questions and then fifteen minutes of hardball questions. Right. So where he would really play devil's advocate and really, you know, come at me. And he said, because yeah. he had done a whole bunch of them with a bunch of controversial, other controversial figures. Um, and he he said afterwards that he felt like he really hadn't done his job in the second half mm. because he was so interested in hearing my explanations of the difficult questions that that, you know, so he didn't come in and interrupt and attack and play yeah. Chris, Chris Matthews. Right. Um, yeah. And uh and I said, well, okay, but here's the thing, right? I have to defend, because I am counter-narrative, I have to defend everything yeah. that I say. And I have yeah. to back it all up. And so I had already anticipated every single huh. difficult question that you could possibly yeah. ask me. And I have answers ready for that. Um, yeah. And so that has, it's, it's, like, a, it's, it's like being tempered. Um, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And, You're that, that whole concept of anti-fragility. Yeah. Like with the, with the students that Evergreen is trying to bolster, trying to lift up, trying to empower, they're actually making them even more fragile yes, and yes. even more vulnerable by oh, absolutely. giving them all this stuff. Absolutely. And they're not doing anything for their futures either, because you know, when the real, world, just their present, when, when the real world, right. Of people who hire people for jobs looks mm -hmm. at the unless those people are, share the exact same super radical agenda right mm -hmm. um unless they're community organizers or they're they head up activist groups or whatever right they're not going to be interested in hiring any of these people um i would not touch any of those protesters with a 10-foot pole because mm -hmm. they there is no way to criticize them as an employee without getting yourself into more trouble yeah. than, than they're worth right yeah. Um, and frankly, when you look at when you look at somebody who is a student in a in a university, um, and they are complaining that they are oppressed, right? Mm -hmm. And they might have had difficulties, of course, right? And maybe a place like Evergreen would uh, would attract people who have had difficulties, socioeconomic difficulties, difficulties mm -hmm. with learning disabilities, or you know, other types of special needs, uh, they, they might not fit in very well to normal society, whatever, right? But the entire gist of 
what I have seen uh, being publicized in terms of what went on at Evergreen would be all of those problems have been exacerbated by their experience there, right? Mm. Um, that they have mm. not learned how to cope with the world, right? They have uh, they've, they have learned it's not how, even that. They have learned how to take control of a situation that they were allowed to take control of and behave like bullies and thugs. They were, right. they took, they, they took all this well-meaning, um, labels and ideology that they were handed and they weaponized the whole lot of it. They yeah. used all these marginalities, all this language to claim absolute authority, uh, absolute control of the situation and the teachers, which is, I, I try not to concentrate on students cause I don't want to deal with like issues of like sparking a hate mob or anything against them. But I, I, so I train myself on the admin, I train myself on certain faculty right. and they're the ones who are even to this day, they're still saying the students did nothing wrong. They were acting in their best interest. This is great. We are on the right path. This is what needs to happen. It's their turn now. It's it's absolutely mind boggling because do they really think that the world is going to survive if we flood the entire society with victims and yeah. with me me memers? Now, these me me memers and I, snowflakes and, I, I, and, and yeah, yeah no, I, I just don't feel like and taking it, it, out the it garbage. It can't perpetuate yeah. because like these people are eventually, even if they have their genderness all over the board, they're going to produce offspring and those offspring are going to grow up around narcissists. They're going to be fucked up for their whole lives, yeah. not know how to cope. So hopefully the pendulum swings back, but they're not, they're not taking a fuller view of not even there. So they're, they're rejiggering how we look at history. Mm -hmm. They're, placing all this power in the present and they're not thinking at all about the future, like the real future, how it's yeah. going to, for, how it's all going to play out. Well, I think, um, I think a dangerous. lot, I think a lot of the people who are in these sort of, a lot of the people who teach, you know, women's studies, gender studies, uh, you know, uh, I guess African American studies, you know, uh, indigenous studies, right. All of these and interdisciplinary studies and all of these, groups that are sort of infested with this uh it's a conflict theory model essentially mm. and that's that's the prime lens that they look through when they examine uh society and how it works is yeah. through conflict theory and so what you have with these people is they're so divorced from what it actually takes to get things done uh to keep the lights on the water running the planes from solution falling, theory from falling out of the sky i mean like yeah. I, you know, and I, I always, I always say this when feminists tell me that, you know, I'm, uh, cause I'm, I'm, I am a blanket anti-feminist. I think that all of their, I think that feminist history is revisionist history. I think that feminist theory is, um, yeah. It is. It only goes so far in describing society, and they want that to represent their description of society to represent the totalitary uh, to totality of of men and women and how things work, right? And because they are so up into everything, right? Mm -hmm. I have decided that yeah, I I need to oppose this, right? Yeah. Um, but. When you look at them and they say, well, you know, you, you're just like spitting on all of the strong women of the past. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Two years ago, I was 25 feet up a tree in my front yard with a chainsaw trying to chop <laughs> it down. You can't tell me, right, that anything a man can do, I can't do, right? You're well, not yeah. going to tell me that, right? And you're not well, going to tell yeah. me that I'm against equality, Right. Or that I'm against women being able to do stuff. Right. I'm yeah. against you and what you say about the world. Right. And yeah. about men in particular. Right? Yeah. I, well, the, the some of the things I I have a problem with feminism um, on a, a, a number of different ways. But one of the things that I have philosophically with it is that it seems to exalt masculinity and mm -hmm. masculine forms of power, which is just. Like what the fuck? That is that's anti-feminism. You guys uh, are the least. You're 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 robbing all of the mothers all the way back to the beginning of all that. 
of attention their, and of their, care they put claim, into us. Of their claim to power, of their contribution to how society yeah. uh, was shaped, of their responsibility yeah. for yeah. how societies operated, right? Yeah. All of those things. You have essentially said that since the dawn of freaking, I guess, the dawn of agriculture, right? Men yeah. have managed to keep women under their boot heel and unlike any other group of people, right? Mm. That power never changed hands over 10,000 years, right? Slave yeah. uprisings galore, whatever. But women, men managed to keep women under their boot heel that entire time. Women were completely powerless. Women had nothing to do with it. They're completely blameless. Yeah. You know, with men, it's toxic masculinity enforced on men by other men. Yeah. With women, it's internalized misogyny. It's not yeah. their fault. It's imposed on them by patriarchal male culture, right? Yeah, no, isn't that saying that women are useless? Useless. What, one, of the, one of the pet theories that I have, and I, I'd I'm going to get this out there because so, I, I know it's totally wrong, but I think that, that feminism um, as we know it now, or academic third-wave feminism, was uh, an attempt of women in the academy to codify this this set of values through the academy and through yes. the lens of the academy. But if you go back to the root of the academy, which is academos, which was a garden where no women were allowed, you just got these old bald men yapping it up, you know, and then Socrates came along and then Aristotle, right? So there's this, there's this masculine tradition that mm -hmm. is codified knowledge in a certain way. While I, I'm totally believe that women were codifying knowledge in another way. Yeah. They just, they, they did it from word of mouth. They didn't get into this whole writing thing. So, so when feminism comes along, it looks at the, the masculine picture of history yes. and completely ignores the invisible history. Yes. Um, that 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 went from word of mouth that that that's invisible but but goes from from in on an empathetic empathetic level on an intuitive level and i really think that this is another theory i'm going to throw it out there that you don't actually have the emergence of the full woman into literature until you have the novel until you have a technology that has the room to actually give her like the complexity, I think women are so much more complex that they weren't able to be codified by men in the in the technology that passed on in the masculine tradition until you have the printing press, until you have a bourgeoisie class that can take time to like really invest themselves in a in a longer form of a narrative and stuff. So I think that feminism is this weird uh, penis envy, this really weird envious, and it's it's lacking. It's lacking that um, the care and the breadth and the intuition and the complexity that is truly inherent in the what I think of as the heretical or the 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 the, matri the matriarchy um, mm -hmm. matriarchy traditions. Well, I, I think well one one of the things that one of the things that I find about feminism is that power an acknowledgement that you have power means that you are accountable, right? And they don't want to hold women accountable. It's that authority responsibility yes, thing. Yes, it absolutely huh. is. And you know, a friend of mine, uh, he put huh. it, he put it this way, and I don't tend to disagree with him. He said, first wave feminism, uh, so the suffragettes and and the like, yeah. were about getting women men's rights without men's responsibilities. Hmm. Okay, and that is absolutely. That's you can go back and you can look at how they reformed different laws and all of that stuff. They got men's rights without the accompanying responsibilities. Second wave feminism was about eliminating women's responsibilities. So it was all about birth control and abortion and, you know, and all of those things. Wow. Right. Third wave feminism is about imposing more responsibility on men. Huh. Right, which is why you're looking at a lower <laughs> standard of proof for sexual misconduct in universities yep. and all yep. of these things, right? And they who wanna... can correct who in a conversation? <clears throat> That's right. They want to hold men more responsible than men already are. And so when when you look at this transition, mm. um, you know, it, it has never been about fairness. It's never been about equality. It has been about essentially getting women always, always, always the best deal at the lowest possible cost. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what they have done is they have rewritten history in terms of, you know, like in the 60s, they came along and told us women weren't allowed to get an education and that's not fair. 
well, okay, in the 1920s, 7% of American men and 6% of American women had college degrees. Okay, yeah. Right? So in the, and then in the 1960s, that mm. was when the disparity between men and women in college started. And that was because of the GI Bill. Okay. Right? So returning veterans who had been yeah. dra drafted were given money where they could buy a house, they could start a business, or they could go to college. And college, a lot yeah. of these men went to college, mm. right? And they flooded the colleges. So that's when all of a sudden you saw this massive disparity between men and women in post-secondary was after the Second World War and then mm. again uh, after Vietnam, right? When okay. these men returning from being drafted, maybe if mm. we drafted women, more women, we'd, we'd have had parity in college at that time, but we didn't. Mm. We didn't draft women, right? When you look at, you know, women were never allowed to work. Well, I have a blacksmith's roster from London from the 1400s that tells me differently. You know, two yeah. master blacksmiths on that roster, a uh, hundred and some men and two women, master blacksmiths in London, qualified to run a business yeah. and, you know, hire employees, train journeymen and, and apprentices, right? You know, like Brewster and Webster are female surnames. Stir means woman, hmm. right? Okay. So anybody that you know who's a Brewster or a Webster is the descendant of probably a woman who had a child out of wedlock who was a master brewer or a master weaver. Huh, okay. Right? Huh. So you're looking at, they, they have told us all of these lies. Yes, most women got married. In fact... Many women tradespeople did not get their trade by credentials, by um, going through the apprenticeship from age 8 or 10, being essentially an indentured servant for that time mm -hmm. until they became a journeyman, at which point they traveled the dangerous roads from town to town, plying their trade until they were in their mid-20s. Most of the women who were plying trades, right, they inherited their trades. They had a way... If they married a tradesman, they could learn their trade from him, and if he died, they could inherit his master okay. status, take on apprentices, hire journeymen, yeah. do all of those things, run a business, right? Okay. own all of that stuff. So essentially what we're looking at is we're looking at this, this bizarre alternate history where women were never allowed to work, they were never allowed to get an education, they were, you know... In, suppressed in the 1800s right Eight, 18 percent of uh in the early 1800s 18 percent of men and women could read and write well enough to sign their own name mm -hmm. to a document and um half of them were women half how could how could that happen if women were not educated if, if only men were allowed to have an education this is like the entire thing is completely bogus. It's completely freaking bogus. Well, okay. So, one, I, I, I'm, I'm getting more and more proof that Evergreen is actually actively um, going after and marginalizing white men. Mm -hmm. um, white male students, they leave them out of the equity reports. Actually, white male students are like one of the one of the highest at risk um, people for, according to their metrics. But they leave that out. For dropping and out. And then I have. Yeah. And they're dropping out. And then I have documentation that uh, within higher up where they they go after white male teachers. They go after them yeah. um, and impose a lot of problems on them. Um, so there's there's that where where it's just it, it seems like going from this this whole narrative is is coming into maturation. Like, OK, now we're finally we now now we can actually oppress the oppressor now. And, and it's OK. We have everybody enough. Everybody's on the same page enough where we can actually go forward with this and it's going to be fine. But the, but the larger problem that I see with that whole way of thinking that you're describing with this uh, conflict theory, yeah. you said, is that um, it's very attractive. It's very attractive, one, because it gets our emotions riled up and two, because it's so easy. It's, it's so much, easy to understand. It's much easier yeah. to go around and critique the world than it is to learn how to build the world, to really get in there. And instead of claiming mastery through your slave ship, gaining mastery of material 
in some way. And so it's corrupting the ability for our society to continue forward. It's going to, it's going to, I, I don't, I don't understand what these people think is going to actually happen when everybody adopts this identitarian conflict theory, because they only want certain people to adopt that and the other people need to just be slaves. And I don't think they're going to get their way. No, I think they're going to, it's going to leave, lead to a bigger and bigger push. And I think we need to stop that somehow by, like you were saying, you brought up a, a, a series of details that, 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 um, argues against the feminist uh, argument, right? You, right? you said, like, here, there's details. But don't you think that, that we do have a lot of work to do to bring up the optics of equality between genders and the equality of sexuality? You don't think that we need to do intentional work? You think that... I don't, I don't know that intentional work is needed. Like, I do think, I do think hmm. there is something to be said. And what I would say is conflict th theory is not completely useless, right? Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. think that, you know, because Marx was sort of the the progenitor of this. It, it is the classic bourgeoisie pro proletariat yeah. narrative, right? Yeah. And that is a, it's just one of several sociological lenses through which to, to view what society is like and how it operates. Uh, what, another one yeah. would be materialism, utilitarianism, things like that, right? Um, yeah. but so it's not completely useless. It's not completely useless in terms of, uh, race, right? Because race yeah. is, is inherently tribalistic and race actually yeah, op okay. operates. We have two sets of hardware in our brains, right? And one has to do with tribalism and the other has to do with sex. Okay. Those are the two things we have to deal with? Well, no, but what I'm saying is, what I'm <laughs> saying is, tribalism can actually be put through this lens, this conflict theory lens. Yeah, okay. Right? Huh. Um, yeah. And, and you can actually get some interesting information from that. Not if that's the only way that you look at things, but if you look at things through that lens, you can, you can sometimes actually kind of get a little bit of insight into how or th how things are working right but mm -hmm. sex and sexism right so racism mm -hmm. functions through our tribalistic um i guess uh hardware right and sexism functions through a completely different set mm -hmm. of mechanisms it's it's okay. if you if you look at sex has in sex has existed long before we were even social animals yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'll agree with that. I mean, that's how we became animals to begin and with. So there's, there's no, there was no continent of men that colonized a continent of women, right? No. Yeah. And took them over. No, we've always co-evolved hmm. men and women, right? Yeah. Together, males and females together. We have always co-evolved. And when you look at, um, when you look at things like war efforts. Um, women are often heavily involved, right? Because those are tribalistic conflicts. Women are often heavily involved in motivating their men in whatever mm. way they they can because mm. it's women and men together make an us. Women and men are not an us and them. Women yeah, and men yeah. together create an us. And yeah. you will see that uh, men of one culture will treat women of a different culture differently mm. in many circumstances. Uh, war yeah. rape is one of the, the big things that, that happens in that direction. But that's not, that's not to say that they're treating their own women in that way because mm. their own women are their own women. Right. Yeah. And so sexism mm. and tribe, like sexism just does not fit. It does not fit into conflict theory whatsoever mm. sexism exists of course but it does yeah. not fit into conflict theory at all at all and so what what i would say is yes mm. there is probably work to be done active work to be done in terms of you know sort of diffusing racial tensions and things like that and i think that we're yeah. going in the exact opposite direction that is needed in terms of yes. all of that stuff um yeah. But, you know, so race baiting needs to end and people just need to be allowed to ask where you're from without being accused 
wh- where are you from without being accused of microaggressing and yeah, being, yeah. being a yeah. racist and things like that. Um, we need to understand that uh, what we call white privilege is actually majority privilege. Um, and uh, if, It exists everywhere. If you're a white person in China, well, you don't have white privilege. You yeah. know, the Chinese have majority privilege. Um, and that, uh, but that men and women interact in a completely different way. And their mm. the dynamics between men and women are absolutely 100% different. You know, like mm. it would be, it would be, it would be like saying every single or 90% of the best buddies in America are interracial right 90 percent of everybody who has a best friend that's an interracial relationship right well no that's not actually the case that's not actually the case right and that then that has been the case for millennia right no men and women fall in love men and women partner together and have children men and women do tend to do what is best for the family for their children they yeah. work as partners all of those things in a very very small tight unit right yeah. that's extremely intimate and yeah. to say that that has any kind of resemblance to when whites arrived on the shores of africa yeah. right and uh, and decided that they were going to colonize um it's absolutely bogus it's it's ridiculous so so you think that the um, that what's happened with like gender studies? Because I've seen this like, like I always like at at Evergreen when I was a student, like you'd meet somebody, you'd be nice with them, and like you pretty soon know what they studied by the way that they would treat me or how they would like yeah. comment on me. Because I, I like to make jokes, you know, that's a big no no. Or I have a problem holding to certain gender uh, pronouns that don't align with how I view somebody, you know, and I'll be corrected on that. Like, no, they're they, you know? And, and so it seems like that, um, woman studies, gender studies thing is, is, a, a tribalism or a tribalist, uh, a tribalizing yes. of, of women being able to become a tribe that, that goes out and does war with this other tribe that they perceive as, as the man, especially the white man. Well, and they, they have a, well, it's not just that. It's not just that they can form a tribe of women and go to war against men. It's they have portrayed men through history as a tribe who has treated women as the enemy and as the other, the outsider. And yeah. I don't think that's the case. I mean, every, every man learns to love at his mother's breast. Yeah. Right. Well, well so, some men learn to love with their dogs and throw bones with okay. their dogs. Okay. Yeah. True. But okay, if their mother is really horrible and their dog is really nice, <laughs> sure. But you know, men learn hmm. love at their mother's knee. Um, men have learned love uh, from their sisters. Mm-hmm. You know, and their and they love their daughters. Mm-hmm. Right. And to, to actually portray men as a kind of political block, right? A tribalistic block mm-hmm. that sees women as an enemy or sees women as a class of people to subjugate and exploit, right? I'm gonna, mm-hmm. I am going to subjugate and exploit all women, including my mother's, sister's, wives and daughter, wife and daughters, mm-hmm. right? Um, for the benefit of myself and every other man out there, none of whom yeah. I even necessarily know, Right, that just seems sociopathic. It, it it seems, it seems like it's projecting a certain sociopathy on men. And it would it would be different if men were ripped from their mothers' wombs and raised in the sole care and custody of men for their entire yeah. childhoods, mm-hmm. right? Maybe you could train a man to see women in that way, right? But that's not how human children are raised. Human children well, are why? raised learning what trust is and learning what nurturing is yeah. from from their mothers as well as their fathers, right? But why, why is that so attractive? Why is that story so attractive? Because it's easy. It's easy and I because, because I believe a lot of the originators of, of this application of the theory of conflict theory to men and women uh, hated men. I've looked into the histories of, yeah. of a lot of them. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft used to sleep at the threshold of her mother's bedroom door 
so that her dad wouldn't be able to get in and beat her mother. You know, you have uh, Susan B. Anthony's father, uh, uh, I believe it was Susan B. Anthony, um, lost everything, lost everything the family owned in a bad business deal, and uh, and she was left with, you know, um, and she felt, because men at that time were the sole arbiters of the finances of the family, she was left, I'm sure, resenting him, right? Hmm. Even though she was educated. And uh, she was working as a uh, headmistress of a girls' school or something. She had to, she had to work for a living after that. And um, so, I mean, hmm. you, you look at all of these uh, women. Uh, there hmm. are a lot of women who were involved in uh, early feminism and second wave feminism who had been deeply wronged by certain men, yeah. maybe by men who should have been... Um, who should have been men that they could trust. Yeah. Right? So there's a, a deep kind of a, a, a traumatic stress that, a that, that is of, embedded into it. Yeah, and a projection of that onto huh. how this is how society works. And then they write the theories, and the theories are so easy. The theories are so <sighs> easy. Right? I wow. mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're convoluted and they, they have so many escape hatches, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. where they could. You're say, always well, on top. If you use these, you're always going to win. Well, we're, and we're not, we're not, we're not saying men are in charge of everything, you know, except that we just said that, but okay, this, this little addendum that we put in way over here, mm -hmm. right in the fine print over here and, and whatever means that we acknowledge that women have agency within the gender system. But then the next thing out of their mouths is that it's not her fault. She has internalized misogyny. And so, I mean, it's, it's essentially this, I do believe because women are a certain way, um, mm -hmm. they have an inherent ca uh, caution around overt power. Right? Because, well, that's that's look, inherently that's the feminine that's the fe feminine agency. I mean, I, I've I've seen this and I've critiqued this. I say a lot of this intersectional um, rhetoric. If you look at it, it's it's very very passive aggressive. And yeah. I, I worked in preschool for a, a long time, which is a ninety nine percent woman do dominated uh, you know yeah. career. So I worked around women constantly, and and I see that instead of confronting an issue, it's always. Would you like to do that? Would you better do that? You're trying to re uh, indirectly influence people, which is fine, which is great. But once it becomes negative, once it's used as the rubric to control society, you never know where you stand. There's no direct way, like like I just watched your video about consent. There's no actual way to say, okay, here is the line in the sand. You yeah. know, it's like, no, well, there's a line there, but the wind shifts it and it's sand anyway, so it's going to move. You know yeah. that, you know, yeah, it's just yeah, like, yeah. OK, well, how do how do I not get in trouble with you? And to, yeah. I you end up internalizing that and then I can never have any agency at all. I have to leave. I have to leave the academy. I can I can't like actually do anything productive in that system because I can't say this is. I, I know it's subjective, but we're going to say this is where the line is so we can get and build something bigger. Than right. That. You have to do that. Well, I think. So I wonder. I think women. I think women evolved, because you have to look at you have to look at power in the sense of not not what power is like now, right? Where the worst hmm. thing that's going to happen is you're going to get impeached or whatever. You're going to you know you might serve a few years in prison or something like that, right? Like, yeah. um, men, uh, kings used to have shorter life expectancies than serfs, because. Oh, yeah because they routinely got their heads chopped off. Yeah. Right? And officers in the military back, you know, three, four hundred years ago had a higher death rate than infantrymen. Because oh, really? because they were they targeted. The well and because they yeah. were not okay. sitting they were not sitting miles away from the battlefield watching a video screen, right? And yeah. on a radio. They were there, right, within range of, of the enemy and they were specifically targeted right because they had mm. power because they were in authority and so mm. essentially power has been extremely dangerous right um cleopatra mm. no surviving offspring right oh, Ki yeah. killed yeah. herself rather than be captured right so how many women do you think in history were willing mm. to actually grasp that type of power that yeah, overt okay. i'm in charge kind of yeah. power and I how, am the target how, yeah 
how many would have been whispering in their man's ear, right? Like Lady <laughs> Macbeth, okay, right? Who, if Shakespeare had mm-hmm. really actually known what women are like, would yeah. not have written that she killed herself. She, they, he would have written the play totally differently. She, if he had known what huh. powerful women were like, he would yeah. have written it to end with Macbeth dying and Lady Macbeth going up to the victor of that battle and saying, he was such an abusive husband. He, he, tried, he forced me into all of this. Please have mercy and attach yourself to that guy and rise to power again. Survive that. Mm. Live to reproduce so, another day. Yeah, is there... Is there man. I'm going to throw out a theory here, so disagree with me or whatever, but is there... Um, because uh, women have been freed from the consequences of reproduction, and they can choose whenever they reproduce, is there a certain amount of energy and attention that young women have that's not being invested into you know, offspring at the start of life that is uh, not knowing, hasn't found like the correct um, uh, way to organize itself? And so gender studies and women's studies is just taking the energy that would go into children and trying to redirect it in another project like like now society is my child or something like that. I'm I'm the mother of everyone now or something. That might actually be it. I, I don't know if that's what gender studies is trying to do, but I think that a lot well, of yeah, women but... I think that a lot of women seek it out because it does fill a void. And one of the things that I found really interesting, uh, that I read just the other day it was a study that just came out, um, that uh found that uh women in positions of high status are far less likely to um, reward their uh, mentor and reward their underlings, their same-sex underlings, to help out women come up, help women come up the ranks than men are with other men. And they mentioned in the study that this Mm. difference begins in early childhood, where women if girls tend to associate mostly when they build relationships with other other children they tend to associate most mostly with girls who are among their same socioeconomic status the girls of the same social status right and they they form Mm -hmm. these sort of i guess girl gangs um where Mm they they all have similar status whereas boys tend to choose from a variety of strata um more based on interest um not necessarily based on, based on willingness and well and base it's based on status right so you will literally have and you see this you know as someone mm. who's had kids and and uh, and all of this and my stepson in particular because he was extremely extremely socially adept and and uh, it was i guess you would consider him a bit of a you know i guess an alpha in terms of mm-hmm. being able to uh, bring both the boys and the girls to the yard, I guess, right? Okay, you know, huh, and be yeah. popular and charming and charismatic and all of that stuff, right? Um, but he, when he would go to the park with my young, like with my kids, um, to supervise them, he would immediately try to organize a game of capture the flag or something like that with all yeah. of all of the kids at the park, and it was the boys who were mostly into this the boys who and he would so they would separate themselves into two teams and it would sort of be like and you would Hmm. you would do that kind of um you each take a turn and pick so you pick the best most athletic people all the way down to the nerdiest the nerdiest still get on the team they're picked last but they still get on the team right the least athletic kids and Hmm. one of the things i think that because you have these these two roles that have been universal for men for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And one is warfare, right? Or, you know, uh, I guess battle, um, because warfare between two groups of 150 people doesn't necessarily count as war. Um, but battle and hunting and group hunting, specifically big game hunting with weapons that don't necessarily work that great. And, you know, and people, uh, humans or hominids hmm. two, two million years ago were quite small. They didn't have claws. They didn't have horns, right? And they yeah. were trying to bring down things that could kill them, right? And you needed a whole bunch of men to cooperate. Um, and you needed a chain of command, right? Yeah. 
And so yeah. you needed people that the entire hierarchy itself implies that someone will be at the top of it and someone will be at the bottom of it and yeah. that every member will be rewarded because if you don't reward them, they'll either yeah. go to the other guy who is offering a reward or your underlings will, will collaborate with each other yeah. and bring you down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, you saw fragging and happening in, in Vietnam uh, a lieutenant hmm. puts his entire platoon, platoon, sorry, sorry, in danger over and over and over again. Well, he's going to find himself shot in the back by accidental friendly fire. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, you have this, but you have this chain of command, this hierarchy that that forms when when men do things and play is a form of preparation for adulthood, right? And it yeah. is largely instinctive, and so you see boys choosing playmates who are of differing status because they're not trying to build a consensus right like women largely are of mm. like people they are trying mm. to build a team of people who all serve different roles and have different ranks right so because too many cooks yeah. spoil the hunt and right? it's all pointed towards a, a, the same thing Yes, and so I think that when women, and these hierarchies that men form, they are absolutely necessary to large organizations, right? You have to have somebody in charge. You have to have a yeah. chain of command. You have to have interlevel protocols. You have to have, um, because not everybody knows each other, right? Um, you know, when you, have a, when you have a family, everybody can be a communist, Right. You know, I don't, yeah. I don't breastfeed my baby and say, well, I'm only going to give you as much breast milk as you earn through your productivity out in the fields, right? No, I give, <laughs> I give, you know, I'm not yeah. a capitalist in that way, Based right? Based on need. Based on need yeah. and according huh. to what I can give, right? And so, but as yeah. you expand outward into areas where relationships become more shallow and, uh, mm -hmm. and people may not even know each other, may not even be aware of each other, that guy on the eighth floor doesn't know the guy on the second floor, right? On the opposite yeah. side of the building, but they're still working within a hierarchy within that corporation. And I think that women have a really hard time adjusting to that. And mm. you see kind of in the way they've mm. tried to say that, you know, the, the sort of women can bring a certain something into corporations that will help them be you know, um, that will help them be more productive and more welcoming and more of this, that, and the other. We need to change the culture, the corporate culture, yeah. to be more women-friendly, okay? Yeah. But that's not necessarily corporation-friendly, right? Because once you get rid of those hierarchies, yeah. how does the guy on the second floor communicate yeah. with the guy on the eighth floor, right? How do they even know their roles? So yeah. I, think that, I think that women oh. have... I think that women, when they've started to go out into the place where that men have evolved to operate in, yeah. right? I think that they have a hard time, and I think that they see it as hostile, and I think yeah. that they see it largely as intentionally hostile. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, one. One of the. Um, one of the diversity workshops is called an anti-oppression workshop that I went to as part of uh, you know orientation for my job at school. Um, there, before they did their whole privilege spiel, one of the speakers said, you know, I want, I really wanted to be in science. I really wanted to like pursue biology, but I, I just, I wasn't supported in that. So I went over to doing this other thing, you know, I'm like, science isn't about supporting you. Why do you Science need... is about learning something, you know, you don't need support from a scientist. You just need to kick your ass into gear. Honestly... And, and, but that... That spills over into the whole thing. It's like we need to nurture everybody. We need to make sure that everything's changed depending on it's trying to turn science into a big breast, right? And yeah. just like just like here's the nipple. That's that's and quotable. Like, you don't have to do anything, just open your mouth and we'll give it to you. That's you're right? so quotable. Science is just a big <laughs> breast. Benjamin Boyce, twenty seventeen. But I but I wonder <laughs> I wonder if it, i I I do think that feminism is misguided, but I do think that we need to start men and women or women themselves need to start figuring out how they can operate in the world 
Um, and, and if they need to make their own structures and experiment with different sorts of corporations that do integrate their particular skill sets and their particular natures, that's a great thing. And that's what needs to happen. But to change what men have built to dismantle the patriarchy or to yeah. go after the patriarchy is not going to fulfill them because they're not doing the positive work. Yeah. of building something that, that actually works for them. And I wonder if we can get to a point with gender studies or whatever to turn it away from critical theory into some sort of assimilation theory or, or some sort of proactive, like, this is how we are going to operate. This is this is our particular skill set. Here's the cor sorts of corporations. Here's the, even the sorts of technology that we can provide. But if you look at maybe it's just nursing. Maybe it's just like these things that are always already there for us right. that are more suited for that or have organizations there. But instead of instead of attracting and trying to change the corporate culture, why not experiment with new forms of culture? And instead of denigrating men, just like really take a hard look like the Demore memo, just like right. really take a hard look at how women are set up yeah. and not say that women need to be like men. M women have inherent value that yeah. it has uh, afforded us the ability to become human, to become psychologically... Um, Sorry, psychologic this is my, my idiotic alarm. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. But to become, I, I think that women have, and I've watched this on the playground, like that complexity of discourse that women provide to children, that indirectness allows for the child to start to assemble their own consciousness yeah. by looking at this complex um kind of uh hive mind that a woman can can extend herself into into being and i think that if we can go back to adulating femininity as its own form of power and its own form of strength then that might be able to the way forward rather than just denigrating men and, and just being envious and resentful of men well for it, how they're it, doing it. it really it really strikes me as hilarious that you know that the feminists tend to be essentially um, that we don't like men and we don't like the way men do things. And we find all of this stuff very toxic, right? Um, corporate culture and the whole bit. But, you know, we want women to be 50% of CEOs and C-suite positions and executives. We want sweet, women to... Sweet, sweet, sweet street sweeper positions? C-suite. C-suite. So CFO, c suite no, no, okay. no, they don't want women to be 50% of street sweepers or sewer workers or, you know, bin okay. collectors or, or recycling guys in, you know, in their truck that pick up my blue bags every week. Yeah. They, don't, they don't want women to be up in cherry pickers cutting down trees or, or yeah. fixing power lines. They don't want women to be doing the nasty, dirty um, business. Mm. There are some government initiatives trying to get women into the trades. Um, at least here in Alberta, but I don't see them being, they're yeah. not, there's not as much of a cheerleading squad on the feminist side of things to get women yeah. to learn how to be plumbers and pipe fitters and steam fitters and welders, um, as there are to get women in those positions of power, right? In academia, mm -hmm. in yeah. politics, yeah. in... They want profile. They want yeah. the high profile. They're attracted to that high profile. Yeah. And they, you know, like one of the things that I think is is really i think needs a little bit more scrutiny is i mean mm. when when you look at female politicians right and not all of them but uh a lot of them will run on a platform of women's issues mm -hmm. right? when was you when was the last time you saw a male politician running run on, on, men's on, issues? on men's issues all issues are men's issues. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, so. every day is International <laughs> Men's Day. Um, yeah, right. You know, but it, it's like, and like in Canada, we have a minister responsible for the status of women, right? And although this is largely an honorary position, okay, okay. it's, they usually pick a, a, a minister who's all already responsible for something else, and they make that person responsible for the status of women in Canada. The status of women. Yes. So what does that even it's mean? like equality. It's an equal it's a women's equality minister. Okay. okay. So but one of the things that they have is they have a certain amount of veto power. So say the say the Minister of Health has just done a survey of uh, patients across uh, one of the provinces and they've found that uh, through normal screening processes in doctors' offices, 
uh, 45% of people who report they've been assaulted by an intimate partner are men. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to send that in a report to the Department of Justice. Okay. Or maybe to the Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. Yeah. Um, what happens is it has to, because domestic violence is considered a women's issue, and anything to do with domestic violence impacts women and the status of women, that report must first be vetted by the Minister mm -hmm. for the Status of Women before mm -hmm. it goes anywhere else. And she has, or he, I guess, because um, it's, it's not a gendered post, but they have the opportunity to redact anything mm -hmm. that they want from that report before it yeah. goes on. And uh, mm. so it's next to impossible to get anything done, right? Okay. I, I, had, I had a friend of mine who, uh, he killed wow. himself a few, a few years ago. Um, and, uh, but he ran the only uh, Alberta's uh, first domestic violence shelter that was um, mm. only for men. And over the course of, he had, for 20 years, he had run a, uh, a like a mm. crisis line for men. And then he he had tried for about six years to get funding from the Alberta government um, for to fund a shelter for men who were victimized, and he just kept getting the runaround. And they would send him from they, the Minister of Health and Human Services in Alberta would send him to the Status of Women Canada Minister, and the Status of Women Canada Minister would say, "Well, number one." Uh, we have, this has nothing to do with me, right? Um, go to the, the, uh, provincial mm. department of health and human services to get funding. And the department of health and human services would say, we need approval from status of women. And so he would, he was bouncing back and forth. He tried two human rights complaints. Both of them were denied. And both times he was up against a lawyer from the province of Alberta and a lawyer from the Alberta network of women's shelters um, who were arguing that he should not even get a hearing and he did not get a hearing either time. And, um, mm. and he eventually opened up a shelter on his own with his own funds and private funding, but he couldn't keep it open. He lost the house yeah. and, and then he killed himself. And uh, wow. what you have here is sort of a, it's a, it's a, Nobody wants to look at it, right? And mm -hmm. there are things in mm -hmm. government um, that have been put in place by feminists, right? By the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund and, and mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, uh, Ontario, the on Ontario Coalition to End Violence Against Women um, and all of these organizations, these feminist organizations, to keep the status quo as it is, which is, you know, over 20 years, my friend got mm -hmm. a single grant of $800 from the government, and that was it, right? And mm -hmm. Alberta spends yearly uh, 200 and some million dollars on female victims of domestic violence and on mm -hmm. batter treatment programs for, for male perpetrators, right? And he got a grant mm -hmm. of $800 once yeah. in 20 years. So, I mean, like, this is, this is why, and that model that feminists are using, that they've incorporated into everything, right, is a, it is a male perpetrator, female victim model. It is an oppressed yeah. oppressor model. Yeah. And, uh, and nothing, they, they will not accept the existence of, yeah. like, he was invited and the the then director of the Alberta Network of Women's Shelters, they were both invited onto a program to talk about male, male victims, a uh, public access program called Alberta Primetime. And he was told by production staff that she had declined to come on because even discussing male victims would lend legitimacy to the fact that they, to the idea that they exist. Hmm. Right? So she wouldn't even come <laughs> on to argue that they don't exist because that would be humoring him and people yeah. might actually be led to believe it. And so, I mean, like this, this goes, and this has gone on for a long time. I mean, this is, no, not, I've heard similar stories. Yeah. Down this, here. this is not something that's new. Um, what we're seeing now is we're seeing in academia, um, the expansion of programs that 
that promote this, right? So maybe in the 1970s or 80s when when all of these things were implemented in government, it was just a few, a handful of women in academia, right? But now it's, or a handful of people in academia, but now it's, it's so many, um, 900 women's studies programs out there, right? And, uh, yeah. and however many more interdisciplinary studies and indigenous studies and black studies and all of these things, yeah. right? And th- yeah. these are not, academic disciplines they're activist disciplines oh yeah absolutely evergreen evergreen is attempting to initiate um the uh the what what would it be it's like the the feedback loop of all feedback loops by requiring everybody who's hired to conform to this diversity protocol to have experience Mm -hmm. of diversity or to everybody has to think the same way Mm -hmm. about diversity so it's an anti-diversity of thought diversity of surface yeah. kind of feedback loop. And they want they want to institute that in such a way that the whole academy, that whole college is going to be one echo chamber that will that will all have one sort of view. And basically, and I, I see it, it's it's gonna be very disparaging of a very specific class of student is going to be railed and harried and not given any resources and hang out to dry. And that white male student is kind of like i don't know i don't know if this is racist or not but like his whole society is funded this state yeah institution right the, the middle america white middle america is funding this institution yes that wants to completely denigrate white middle america and say you know we're gonna take advantage of all these light all this light and heat and technology that was provided us and hate on the man you know like yeah. hate them on together and like get ahead of him like when you're not actually going to produce anything. You're just going to produce a bunch of activists who aren't going to even have the ability to really, I'm going through the documents, like they don't even have the good idea what they're talking about. Like it's not even making sense. I don't know how they're going to build anything with that. Right. So. Yeah, no, I know. And it's um, it's really uh, like cause in, in the UK right now, um, they've done projections and they've found that of hmm. of kids who are in kindergarten right now, the group least likely to attend college, the demographic least likely to attend yeah. college is low income white males. Yeah. Right. So what we're looking and then what they're projecting and Joe Biden was like saying, oh, you know, in 2050, America is going to be the whites are going to be a minority in America. Right. And that's great. And I'm thinking, OK, that's I don't I don't have a problem. OK, with whites becoming a a absolute minority in America, like 49 percent or 45 percent of the population or whatever. Right. What I have a problem with is if that happens while these narratives remain mainstream oh, yeah. and yeah. while there are no legal protections, no, no legislative protections and no protections within the case law for for white and particularly white men against discrimination because every single genocide that's ever happened has started with men, um, men and boys. Oh, um, okay. And, uh, you know, those huh. are the ones you kill first. So we're, we're essentially promoting a bunch of narratives that are demonizing, in particular, the first people who are going to be targeted if and yeah. when a genocide occurs when whites become a minority. And, mm. you know and dehumanizing them and it's like and one of the things that i see happening because you know yes you can go back and look at 1930s germany right and you can look at you know the the talk of you know it's verm there the jews are vermin and they're scum and they're dogs and they're pigs and all of that right but Mm -hmm. that's not the only narrative that was playing out there it was also Mm. the jews are powerful the Jews have yeah. unearned privilege and the Jews are in control of everything. Yeah. Right? And we have all of that about white males going on in our society right now. And Well, it's just it's so we were so it seems like and maybe like this is rose colored glasses from five years ago. We but were it seems so like close. we were we were, we were so close, close to just like 
okay, we can let go of that stuff and just get to work because the planet's be, gonna die soon. Let's so let's just, just be get colorblind together. and yeah, no, and and let's accept our differences, but look at our similarities and focus on those and get. And apparently, on. all that stuff, all that stuff is like the the most offensive stuff, like. To not see color is the most racist thing that you can do and That is so, as, a, as a white person. That is so um, fucked up. You know, like, okay, so I have, I have um, some Muslim friends that I worked with, and I got to know them really well. And, and I would talk to them at, at length about their culture. They were both from Lebanon. Um, and uh, about their culture, about what marriage is like, about the expectations on men and women, about, you know, how, how everything works and, and the whole bit, right? And they were really happy to talk to me about it because I'm, I'm coming at it from a point of curiosity, not condemnation. I'm not saying, I, you know, like I'm not going, well, how do you treat your women? Right? No. I'm like, well, how, how does this whole marriage thing work? What are the obligations yeah. and entitlements on both sides? Like, you know, and... Okay, so yeah, I see that you guys both kind of have, you know, an even contribution, right? I mean, and you both are stuck in roles, right? You're, mm. Neither of you are necessarily choosing these roles for yourselves. Yeah. It's not necessarily what you would each choose for yourselves, but, right, you contribute to her, she contributes to you, and, and mm. it all kind of evens out its way, right? Mm. And you can see cases, I'm sure, where... Uh, uh, an unscrupulous man would take advantage of certain certain aspects of that, and an unscrupulous woman would take advantage of certain aspects of that. But, mm -hmm. but you know, like I, I'm genuinely curious how things work in your culture, and they were so happy to talk to somebody mm -hmm. who just wanted to hear about it, who just yeah. wanted to learn about it. Whereas, you know, according to this this whole thing, you know, I I felt entitled. I felt entitled to know, right, and to ha to oh, order yeah. them to tell me about their culture and, and yeah, and they they had to do all the emotional labor to yes, explain it to you. Yes, yes, and and they you know they had to enact the labor and and all of this, and I'm just like, are are you like they wanted to talk about it? Like I just, I don't I don't fucking like how have we got here? I just don't understand it. Like I I want to live in a colorblind society. I want to live where you know, my boyfriend's cousin who's dating the Filipino guy is like, that's totally cool. I, if my, yeah. any of my kids fell in love and wanted to marry a, a person of color or, or whatever, if my youngest turns out to be gay, I, I don't care. I don't care. I just want them to be happy and I want them yeah. to be safe. Well, right? the, the argument against that is that you are, you're erasing their difference by saying that people aren't unique. Because you're saying that everybody's the same, no, so the, it's I'm a very uncharitable. Every, I'm saying every single individual is unique. I mean, look at me. Yeah. I don't toe the feminist party line. I don't agree with a lot of women. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm extremely freaking unusual, atypical, in mm -hmm. terms of my views and beliefs, right? And like, I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm the one who's saying, why are you assuming that all women would feel a certain way about something? Right? Why are you assuming that all blacks have the same experience, right? Or have the same personality or have the same mm. traits or have the same capabilities? Well, right? do you think that it's it's like the that we, we got to a place of, I don't, maybe, maybe we didn't get to a place where we had put this stuff behind us. Um, but it seems like it came, this tribalism came back with a very, very quickly with a huge vengeance. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if... Um, and if it's just a few bad actors or if this is like some sort of like periodic thing where it just kind of rises to the surface where we devolve into this kind of infighting, um, because it seems like to me in academia, like there, there was these ideas that were very open for abuse and they didn't start out ne necessarily in with the intention of being abused. But once intersectionality, critical theory, conflict uh, theory gained a certain mass, it attracted or it produced abuse. And that's what we're, we're seeing, that it's either inherently flawed or it attracts inherently flawed individuals to that. So I wonder if there's a way to right the ship. Okay, well, you know what, uh, something I said on, the, on my podcast the other night, um, or the Honey Badger Radio podcast, 
the other night was that what was going on when Mar- when the civil rights movement was happening, when when people were talking about integration, when people were talking about color blindness, and when you actually had white people objecting to Jim Crow laws because uh, you you would have a maybe an owner of a coffee shop or a, a diner, right, who wanted those black customers but was actually barred by law from mm. serving them right and so he was just like yeah no i want to i want to serve anybody whose money is good right and uh, so i mean you you had this this period of time where we were willing to sort of make broad changes and really engage in that sort of rhetoric of not mm. the color of their skin but the content of their character and all of those things Mm-hmm. Um, and what was happening at simultaneously was the Cold War and mm-hmm. the, the battle against communism in, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, in, the, the insidious, uh, creep of communism into American culture. And these were, um, existential, mm-hmm. immediate existential threats that the American public could get behind and they could actually, that helped mm-hmm. them. I, look at, look at, you have a multiracial group of people maybe even people who all hate each other, right? Look at, look at Star Trek, okay? Mm-hmm. Star Trek. I'm just today watching an episode of Star Trek Enterprise where, you know, the, the engineer from Enterprise crashes on, on a planet because he's been shot down by some hostile alien who also crash lands on this, this moon or whatever, right? And they have to work together to survive because there is an existential threat and they beat yeah. each other up and they hash out their differences and they go through all mm. of the mistrust and everything. But eventually they're like, they're like, okay, we have to work together against this larger threat that's outside of us, right? That's coming yeah. for both of us, right? And that, I think, is what allowed humans, mm. at least in the West, to engage in this sort of we are all we are all one america no matter no matter how what color you are whatever right we are all one america because of this existential immediate existential threat of the cold war of nuclear annihilation of mutually assured destruction all of those things and once that Hmm. once the soviet union fell all i think that's what essentially got us Hmm. to start balkanizing again Right. And mm-hmm. because it's it's like we need it's like we need a foil. Our yeah, we unity, do. particularly when groups get very, very large, our unity depends on a on a on an enemy. Yeah. Um, huh. that we can rally. Necessarily? Necessarily you think? I think so, yes. Huh. So. Is that like is which is the bigger um, problem it's, it's in global warming or right? that you know well global warming you're not going to convince people and i i think that and i'm part of the reason that you're not going to convince people well i'm not part of the reason but i represent part of the reason that you're not going to convince people about that global warming is that threat um cfc's hmm. were they were immediate and observable by everybody, because everybody started to get sunburns who never had to wear sunscreen before, right? And, uh, you know, the ozone layer was was mm-hmm. deteriorating. We saw pictures of it. It was, it was very there, right? Mm-hmm. And what did we have to do, right? We had to, industry had to put in a, a big effort, same like with Y2K. Industry had to put in a big effort and, and fix the problem, and then it was fixed, right? With CFCs, we had to put in a big effort. We had to uh, design fridges different ways. We had to, you know, mm. pay 50 cents extra for a can of hairspray or an asthma inhaler. And, and then that was it. That was how we had to adjust mm. our lifestyle in order to defeat that threat, right? And that threat was something that every one of us could see, right? Mm. In our daily lives, getting a sunburn when we would not have otherwise gotten a sunburn. And... Um, but with global warming, there there are things about, uh, well, I mean, we call it climate change now because we can't prove that the globe is warming to the degree that uh, mm-hmm. the projections were. And if you know anything about computer modeling, you'll know that there's really no way they can make the projections that they're making with the amount of certainty that they're making them. Um, mm-hmm. And so essentially... Uh, 
you're going to have, and, and it's not going to be an easy fix like that. It's not going to be, we're going to, we're going to fight a, a brief battle and defeat this. No, this is like, this is a in perpetuity change in lifestyle, right? And the change in lifestyle that you're asking from people is you're asking people who live uh, in climates where it gets to be 40 below for two months of the year to not burn fossil fuels, yeah. right? And uh, and so you're essentially mm. asking people to freeze to death. You're asking people to, and you're asking people in and every single political action in terms of global warming has mm -hmm. been punitive towards people who actually, um, Canada contributes 2.5% of carbon emissions yearly in the world, and we're being asked to handicap ourselves, ex excruciatingly handicap ourselves, um, in terms mm -hmm. of being able to stay warm in winter and stay alive and get mm -hmm. around in our gigantic, not very densely populated country, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're being asked to to take these extreme measures that would really, really, really damage everybody's quality of life in perpetuity, right? So that we can reduce global carbon emissions by 0.03%. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah. And uh, at the same time, these accords are giving countries like China and India uh, sort of carte blanche to to continue it with their development and with their burning yeah. of fossil fuels. And, and so it's, that is too complicated a thing to get everybody yeah. behind. You're not going to get everybody behind that. We would be much so, better off if aliens came down and made themselves. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, I just, I, I wonder, I mean, if, if we, if a group of a size of our size necessarily needs an external threat in order not to, um, disintegrate into a bunch of tribes like can that external threat be an inanimate object does it need to be human like it doesn't... can we just like can we pretend that there's like an evil god out there that we all need to <laughs> you like, mean like the devil like yeah like 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 this devil that will only be defeated by us like treating each other like human beings like that's the that only would, way that for the devil so to so great that would be so great but i don't think you're gonna get that um you know like honestly it I think maybe warning people like this is this is what I'm trying to do is I'm war trying to warn people about their own nature because okay most of us are on autopilot most of the time there have been studies yeah. done that indicate 95% of everything we do in a day we do it and then we think then we back rationalize why we did it and yeah. then we think that we decided to do it when really we didn't yeah, yeah. um so mm -hmm. essentially what we have is a situation where people don't really understand themselves. And I think people have a, a level of hu hubris in terms of believing that they are above chimpanzee like behavior. Yeah. Okay. Right. They're, they're above that kind of ooh, ooh, ha, ha, fling poo. Right. Um, mm. they, they, and for the reasons that chimpanzees do it and, one of the interesting things about chimpanzees is like they engage in warfare, they engage in genocidal violence, right? Mm. And there's nothing in the environment that they've found that really triggers that. Um, you would expect that it would happen when territory is scarce or when resources yeah. are scarce, but it happens just as often when times are lush, when the mm. cotton is high and the catfish are jumping or whatever, right? Like it's just like it's yeah. summertime and the living's easy right and everybody's bored yeah right um you know it's it's just hmm. it's just what we do and if we would if we could get off our high horse and stop thinking of yeah. ourselves as these evolved beings who are past all of that really really nasty stuff right um we're not bosnia showed us we're not rwanda showed us we're not right uh, the Second World War showed us we're not, right? The mm. Holocaust showed us we're not beyond that. There's, there's nothing integral to the German people or the German genome that that yeah. made them super susceptible to being able to create a culture of hatred and vilification that allowed them to do what they did, 
yeah. or led them to do to want to do what they did right it's it's we are we are not wonderful beings the the irony of what you said the solution is to educate people is that it's our institutions of education that are actually in infecting us with this uh high horse chimpanzee um worst of both worlds behavior yes um, self-righteousness and just as vindictive as the, a, a garden snake or probably worse than a garden snake but yeah well i i don't even think garden snakes are vindictive they're just acting on yeah. instinct but um but yeah i think i think honestly sort of trying to let people know i mean because yeah. part of part of what's helped me in all of this is having a meta awareness of my own reactions so you know because i would i would be i would highly object i think um huh. to the white privilege narrative right i would i would say there's absolutely no such thing as white privilege right yeah. absolutely if i was if i was not aware of where that response would be coming from right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not going to argue that there's no such thing as white privilege in Western societies. Whites have it easy in a variety of ways. Institutionally, right, the only yeah. prejudice, the only discrimination that's allowed institutionally um, by law is against whites and against males and against straights, yeah. right? But, mm. um, but at the same time, and, and against mm. Christians, um, but not Muslims, um, but... At the same time, I think that in the broader social context, whites yeah. do have some things easier. Um, I think that straight privilege, right, is, I mean, it's got to be nice to have a bigger dating pool. Um, you know, it, it's got to be nice to, to not have to uh, go to a special kind of bar to, to hook mm -hmm. up with somebody. Right. And I'll, and to not have to have gay. I don't have to have straight dar. Um, and no, no gay man is going to be offended if I make an advance. And then he has to tell me, oh, no, 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 I'm gay. Right. He's yeah. not going to be disgusted by the fact that I hit on him. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like there, there are certain things that, you know, like you, you have to acknowledge the existence of these things. Um, hmm. But at the same time, you have to understand within the broader context where certain cultural narratives can lead um yeah the behaviors that they can generate and the resentments that yeah. tend to lie at the bottom of that and if you stir up yeah. resentment um between groups and so i mean like I, hmm. I don't I don't like white nationalists. I really don't. And I listen to them chanting things like, you know, you won't replace us and Jews won't replace us and all of this stuff, right? And they're so angry and it's just like that's not hmm. that's totally not my style, number one, to march and yeah. chant. But number two, yeah. it's like it it feels icky watching that. It really does. Um but cool. at the same time I have to realize that they're responding to something. Right, and they may not be bright enough to actually understand the entire, yeah, what's going on, but they can intuit something nasty coming, and I think mm -hmm. they're responding to their intuition of that. So, well, the the what what I've seen, and sorry to bring it back to Evergreen, but this mm, is just no, no, what no, I've seen actually, about it. But the what I what I've seen is that you you teach young people this concept of privilege, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and I think like, they don't say exactly why, but like, I think like, okay, you want to teach somebody like to be humble and to just be considerate, just like basic etiquette. Right. Um, but instead of just like teaching etiquette in a positive way, you teach it in a negative way. Yeah. So what ends up happening is that when these young people internalize this way of thinking, they, I, I saw in, in the anti-impression workshop, like you have. Uh, a young woman, she's like, you know, I read this book on privilege. It was a great book on privilege. I mean, it was written by a white male, but still his ideas were really good. And then this other guy's like, well, I'm a white male, but um, I really agree with this stuff. It's like, why do we need to spend all this time apologizing it, to it? Yeah. Like, 
if you want people to learn how to be compassionate, I think we already have these things called religions that maybe we can retool a little bit to yeah. fit our current narrative. But we don't need to create this whole anti-religion of judgment where, where it's, it's just Puritanism all over again. It's like yeah. we're going to go around and judge people because it's much easier to judge people than it is to like actually say, OK, I need to adjust my behavior, but I still need to forgive everybody else. You know, like that's just how I'm going to course correct. I'm going to make a mistake. Then I'm going to see that I actually did harm somebody. But instead of doing that, yeah. you're making the whole world a bunch of harm. Everything's like a micro pico um, <laughs> nano aggression, you know, <laughs> yeah. just like just more and more and more aggression just seeping out into and out of you and into and out of you. And you're never going to be able to again, you're never going to be able to build something. You're never going to actually be able to erect a society and sustain a society of difference of yeah. diversity if everybody's constantly, you know, going 1984 yeah, nitpicking, based on nitpicking, yeah, nitpicking every on each other. It's, 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 yeah, it's just, it's, uh, no, it's and, so petty. It's well, and, so petty. And the reverse hierarchy is really frustrating because, I mean, like, <sighs> there is something to be said for, you know, okay, so some white guy wrote a book on white privilege, right? And he was a white guy and... Okay, so you you can say to yourself, okay, as a white guy who's writing a book on white privilege, he's he's maybe not acting in a self-serving way. He's maybe not, you know, trying to promote an agenda. I would argue otherwise for various reasons mm. that I won't get into. Mm. But, okay, so you can say, it, and it was written by a white man, blah, 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 right? But it was really good. Um, but what I see, what I see is when... When you have the narrative, and the narrative seems to be, okay, and I'm just going to use whites. I could use male uh, if I wanted to, but I'm going to use whites yeah. for now because it actually is the white-black thing is more simple than the man-woman thing. Um, but uh, so you have a narrative where there is a system of white supremacy, okay, and all whites, whether they choose to participate or not, whether they agree with the system or not, whether they actively oppose the system of white supremacy or not, are still benefiting from it. They are still, and they cannot, there is no way that they can take off that hair shirt. There is no way that they can remove their capacity to benefit from that. So this isn't even just original sin where mm. you have original sin, you beg forgiveness, and then you die yeah. and you go to heaven. Yeah, there's no process of... There yeah. is no process of absolution available. Yeah, yeah. Right? And this this is what really worries me, because that mm. ties this sort of... Mm -hmm. uh, a, this, this original sin 2.0 to things mm -hmm. that people cannot change. Yeah. Right? So, they can only ever apologize and subjugate themselves. So it, and, and, and but even, so, even if they do apologize and subjugate themselves, they're still benefiting from the system because they can't well, choose yeah, not the, to. Well, no, I, yeah, the, 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 but the fruition of that narrative, of the conflict narrative, is to just reverse the conflict narrative. Yeah. It in no way solves the motherfucking problem, no. right? And like, I'd, I'd much rather us talk about the solutions of the problem and the origins of the problem, like along with you, you, you talk about like biology, like it's just inherently nature. And Brett Weinstein, he talks about like, just it's built into us. We need to become aware of it mm -hmm. so that we can redirect it and rejigger yeah. the, the forces that brought us here. And instead of doing that, it's just people are hyphenating the exact problem yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. And and I try to tell that, and it's so frustrating about Evergreen. It's like you guys are, well, one, you're paid by the state, two, but you're professors. Yeah. You have like the cushiest jobs, right? Like these people making sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, talking about how they want to dismantle Western society. I'm like, okay, well, give up your house, put your money where your mouth is, and you're not going to do that. Learn you're not going to do learn that. Learn how to change your own fucking tire. You we're gonna yeah. dismantle, we're gonna blow it all up. Yeah, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever survived in a wilderness yeah. area? Right? You know, yeah. like no, yeah. I, I actually went when I was fifteen huh. years old, I went it was uh, about twenty below and I went with a group of uh they were called junior forest wardens. So essentially it was a <laughs> 
It was like Boy Scouts only, like... Yeah, for, like, the elven folk or something. Uh, n no, for... It was, like, more hardcore than Boy Scouts. But, um, you know, like, we actually... Uh, one of one of our party uh, acts almost stepped in a leg hold trap uh, for a wolf. And, you know, like, we oh, were okay. way, way out in the, in okay. the bush. Yeah. But I was given a... Um, I was given a pot. And... Uh, a little bit of uh, trail mix and um, mm. a sheet of plastic and a hatchet. And I was told to build a fire, build a lean-to. Yeah. Right. And I had a sleeping bag. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and survive. Survive the night. Minus 20. Right. Yeah. And, you uh, survived, right? Yeah, I purely it. on your white privilege, you survived. Purely on my well, it's coasted sheet, the through sheet, that. One. The sheet of plastic, I you know, I guess I could have cut some <laughs> evergreen branches or something to keep the snow off me and laid them across or whatever. But you know, I had to build, I had to cut sticks and build a lean to. I had to build a fire. Yeah. I had to you know melt water to drink. I had to you know make sure that the fire was the right distance from the opening of the lean to so that I wouldn't choke on the smoke, but I would still stay warm and, yeah. and all of that. Right. And okay. So can any of these gender studies professors, these interdisciplinary studies professors survive a night in minus 20 weather? Well, to be a... fair, can any of the YouTube skeptic com uh, community do that either? I bet Just to be fair. I bet you Sargon could. You think? I bet you he could. I, I guess he's got that beard privilege. He, he goes hiking. Going for him. He goes hiking in the mountains and oh, okay. you know stuff. He's like well steady. That. Okay, yeah, all right. So cool. He, he right. does stuff like that. I don't know if a, if a bear came across him. I don't know if he would know what to do. <laughs> I would know what to do. Bear, cougar, whatever. I would know what to do. But oh, you're fierce. Just, well, it's just because I lived in a place where you'd drive, be driving in midday, and you'd. I'd be like, okay, I'm driving to the grocery store, and I'm what's that in the sitting in the middle of the freaking intersection? <laughs> and I stop, and it's like, oh, it's a puma. It's it's a puma okay. sitting in the middle of the intersection, one block from my house. That's it, at midday. That's that's great, right? Leave the house half an hour early uh, because I have to go to the grocery store before before driving my kids to school. Right, yeah. the, the bears are still out on the sidewalks. Okay, so right? you, so you know how to deal with the wildlife. You you know you have to know how to deal yeah. with the wildlife. Yeah. they're not out in the bush. They're actually right in town. So, but well, I, I the the the, I, the only problem with the the extreme metaphors you you brought up is that, that we do need to orient ourselves. We we are at a state in our society that we are very far removed from the natural world. Yes, and I think that makes us need to be extra careful about what we put our belief into yes. and to really have some sort of tools to simulate some sort of natural severity to test our ideas. Because, because if we get to a place where we're too fragile and too complex, it can all come crashing down. And so we do need some sort of critical, uh, some, some sort of uh, healthy Tough. critical debate Tough, to, to, toughening up process. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah, like some sort of survivalism uh, with regards to our theories and with regards to our uh, degrees and our departments at the school. Because I think it's 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 inherently privileged to be able to just spindle out all these theories that'll give like feminist blog posters another five years of of advertisement revenue. You know, yeah. like like which don't have any sort of direct effect on you yourself and your job. Or, but will have a great magnify effect on like the society as a whole and public discourse as a whole and how we get along yeah. um, and propagate as a whole. So I think that we do need to somehow simulate natural conditions within our um, unnatural habitat. I think I think the difficulty there is that every every single parent and I'm guilty of this as well, right? Every single mm -hmm. parent wants their children to have things easier than they did. Right, yeah. want, want to have a happier, better, easier mm. way of things than than they did, and yeah. uh, so I think because because I'm essentially mm. uh, I'm still I I guess I don't even know what class I am now, you know, mm. in terms of socioeconomics. 
I, yeah. Finance wise, between myself and my partner, uh, we're definitely upper middle class, but, mm. um, but, you know, it was eight years ago. I was paying on my mortgage with my credit card and searching yeah. in the couch cushions for milk money, um, mm. you know. So it was and waiting tables for a living. So yeah. it, it's like, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to convince parents. Mm to not protect their children i think in particularly mothers to not protect their children from and one of the things that i think is indicative of this like was when i was a kid corporal corporal punishment was still allowed in school and oh, okay. i i cool, was okay. not i was not ever on the receiving end of that um okay. be, not so the because, giving end not not because i was not because I was a good student or anything. I, I was yeah. uh, a disinterested student for the most part. Um, but in elementary school, I knew several mostly boys in my class who got the strap, right? You know, on the hand. Yeah. Um, and they were all given the choice by the principal who, uh, who was the disciplinarian. Um, they were all given the choice. You can take the strap or you can, or, or I will phone your parents. Oh, and every single one of them took the strap. Huh. Every single one. Because they knew it would be much more painful if their parents found out that they were in trouble at school. Yeah. Right? And that was the same with me, um, other than a few specific incidents where my mom took a stand against, you know, the vice principal or whatever with me. What good is... if she, if she's missing too many classes, what good is suspending her going to do other than make her miss more classes type thing, yeah. right? But, um, you know, I, I was never a troublemaker. I was just off doing my own thing uh, a lot of the time when I should have been in class. But, <laughs> um, but with nowadays, I have a friend who was substitute teaching uh, several years ago at uh, a school near uh, in British Columbia. And she says uh, she used to wear Crocs, you know, those really hideously ugly kind of cloggy things. Okay, so she would be, she was sitting at the desk. The kids were supposed to be doing their practice work, and she was sitting at the desk with her legs crossed and her one of her Crocs dangling from her toe. Okay, mm -hmm. and then, then it fell off of her toe, and this 10-year-old boy gets up out of his desk, walks to the front, and horks a loogie in her shoe. Okay. Okay, for no apparent reason. And she sends him to the principal's office, and then he is sent home early. And uh, then they get a phone call from the mother saying, what did she do to make my kid do that? Yeah. Like indignant hmm. mother how dare you send my child home yeah. from school right so it's completely flipped from yeah. when yeah. i was a kid where if i was in trouble at school i was in more trouble at home yeah right yeah. to to having a parent essentially demanding to know why why was my child disciplined huh. for horking a booger into a teacher's shoe yeah for no reason like it, it's just very strange well is um, it is it because children I, i'm throwing out theories again is it because children have become so expensive that they're they're seen as some sort of luxury item that children are that... not expensive <laughs> they are no? not expensive well they're easy to make but you know to feed them and clothe them and no nope. find a good school uh, well they're not okay I find a good school what kind of school elementary school or like university Okay, well, what 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 is it about the attitude shift that that sees child as as some sort of thing to be serviced rather than something that is a human being that needs to learn responsibility? Um, it's the kid. Is it our consumerist culture? Because I see that at school too. That's why schools are going haywire right now. Is because the admin and the students think that it's a place for them. They're purchasing these four years. They want yeah. to be serviced. Not it's not a place where you go and you become better as a human being. You're there, you're served, and then you go on to your career. Um, um, so I wonder if that's part of the. There's a psychological shift. I think I think that it might have started with Doctor Spock, um, you know, and sort of the uh, the anti 
authoritarian parenting movement and you know because I mean I remember when Mm -hmm. I was a kid and my mom would be having coffee with her friends around the table and I would go and pester them and my mom would say go away don't go away mad just go away right and I you know even as a parent uh, when I would be having coffee with my friends and their kids would come up it was like everybody needs to stop talking because little Jimmy has something to say and I was just like just tell him to go away right like, yeah. unless he's bleeding, tell him to go away because huh. he needs to learn some boundaries, right? The grown ups okay. are talking over here, you're playing over there, fuck off, right? That... So, okay, so uh, the, this, this just, uh, this seems like the, the inverse of a tribalism is this narcissism, right? It, so there's this. Well, you, you, I think, I think the, the, the fear... self is the center of everything and then it gl- gloms automatically onto the it's really attracted to that group self. Is well, that what's happening? I, I think, I think a lot of parents, I think a lot of parents really put, I, I was always a raised by wolves kind of parent. Um, and, uh, so the moment that they could do anything for themselves, I was happy to let them. Right. Yeah. So the, the moment yeah. my, my oldest uh, at age, I don't know, like 13 months could open the fridge and grab an apple for himself. I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, you're set for snacks for life, right? Cause, and I don't have to do nothing, okay? And and so I can just, like, sit and do my own thing here, and you can go grab yourself an apple out of the fridge whenever you want. It's That's fine by me. Um, but uh, so it was, and ironically, he was much better at closing the fridge door after himself than my stepson's were. But um, But essentially, I think that, I think that, parents because the fewer and fewer children we have the more Mm. we want to invest in each one yeah Yeah. and so i come from a family Mm. that uh i mean my sister is a she's a doctor she's she advanced extremely high up in the canadian military and now she's in the civil service and wow um so she's she's a high status woman. She had four children, which is extremely unusual for a woman of yeah. her status, particularly since her husband is also a career man. And um, and you know I'm I'm one of three sisters. Uh, it, pretty much everybody in my family had you know three, two, three, four, or even five children. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. six. Right in in this group so i mean it's and i guess i don't know maybe it was the way i was raised to respect that adults have space too and adults are people too yeah and uh and you can't just you know yes when you're a baby you know when you're a newborn um nobody's gonna leave you crying for hours and hours because they just can't be bothered but um, mm-hmm. no, nobody's going to do that. But once you get to a certain age, you know, like, yeah, deal, there's a give and take deal with shit yourself toward, right? in, toward individual responsibility. Yeah. I mean, I think I see that the, the, there's a lack of individual responsibility in the, um, in the narrative, whatever we call it. Some people call it postmodernism. You're calling it conflict theory, right? And like, where, where does the personal responsibility come from? Like both on like the receiving end of like witnessing a microaggression, just sucking it up and going on or on the, on the giving end of like, uh, of like, I'm going to try to advance my society. I'm going to look at my own. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to accept my place in the hierarchy of society that was given to me based on the birth lottery. And I'm going to try to maximize what I've been given and not concentrate on the negative and try to change the world so that the negative doesn't exist, but try to change the world so that I'm giving more positive to the world. Well, I, I don't, I think, I, I do think that there was a, a shift in parenting styles, um, starting in the sixties and, um, and also in educational styles. So, I mean, like when, when I was in elementary school, um, the, the early years were very, um, regimented, right? And then things got a little bit more, um, more, uh, you had more emphasis put on practice work, 
right? And open-ended assignments and, uh, mm -hmm. and cooperative work and less put on time tests. So um, essentially mm -hmm. the way I, and I was, and I remember this because I really resented it because I never did my practice work because I didn't need to. And I hated the open-ended mm -hmm kind of busy work and I hated mm. um, collaborative work because everybody around me I felt they were idiots um, and uh, well I didn't feel they were idiots but I didn't feel that they yeah, were yeah, very yeah. good right and yeah. and I did really well on the time tests I did extraordinarily well on the time tests and I failed several mm. courses throughout uh, elementary and junior high and high school um, just because even though I got 95 or higher on all of my time tests, they put this huge weight on all of this other stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, I think that their performance, like getting results or demonstrating mm. your mastery became less important and mm. sort of inclusion and, you know, making you doing a group project and everybody has a role and everybody gets equal credit and the whole bit, mm. right? That became more of a thing. And I think that, I mean, I, I did Jordan Peterson's personality test. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. He invited well, you did his or yeah, you his, did he, his, he invited me to do his, his one. And he, uh, he found that I had some highly masculinized traits, um, per <laughs> personality traits, and are you okay with that? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, every single relationship that I've had, other than two, has ended because the guy discovered he was dating a man in a woman's body, <laughs> but um, a gay man in a woman's body, no less. But uh, essentially, um, what uh, what I think has happened is we've had this ethic over the last maybe 40, huh. 50 years of we're going to raise our kids a different way. We're going to raise them without spanking. We're going to raise them without, um, hmm. without punitive measures. We're going to raise them in a permissive environment. We're going to raise them while we're going to try and nurture their souls. When in reality, in order to, in order to create a nurturing soul, the primary thing that you have to to demonstrate to a child is that other people are people too yeah right and that you are not yeah. the center of the universe yeah and your soul deserves nurturing no more than anybody else's yeah um and so all of these things and free play hmm. in nature is one of those things that i think has gone between a litigiousness and um mm -hmm and our sort of fear of child abduction and, and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, free play in nature. Like I remember playing unsupervised as a child. Yeah. Me too. Sometimes all day, like yeah. leave the house at nine o'clock in the morning with a canteen of water and a bunch of peanut butter sandwiches, go off yeah. on my bike and come home when the street light comes on the street, yeah. street lights come on. And my mom never worried. And, um, so, I mean, we don't do, we don't allow our kids to do this. And one of the things that is the primary teacher of compassion is free play in nature with other children, with peers, mm. right? Unsupervised by adults. There is nobody there to mediate your conflict, right? Yeah. You have to learn how to get along. And, you know, if you're being a dick and nobody wants to play with you, then you're going to have to learn how to not be a dick. Yeah. Right. And uh, so essentially, I think we've removed so many of the things that, and one of the interesting things, four schools in New Zealand took part in a study uh, where, and I'm amazed that they actually found four schools who were willing to do this, um, where they brought back old school rules for recess. So Which rule? old school rules for recess is no rules. Okay. Right? Climb trees, no problem. Skateboard without a helmet, no problem. Play with construction waste. Build a fort, no problem. Right? Yeah. Do whatever you want, no problem. What they found was injuries actually went down. Bullying almost disappeared. Huh. Right? And it's because you're letting these kids, rather than it being a Lord of the Flies type situation, 
in these small doses or these regu- yeah you know regular doses Regulated, of kids yeah. of kids being able you know and it's not like the, there's no teacher there the, the teachers are in the school and if somebody really gets hurt you know you've got them but yeah. if somebody gets into a pushing match on the playground no adult's going to come in and solve the problem for you and take sides yeah. right and so you you eliminate this sort of need for and this is really the thing I saw with Evergreen is this demand for the administration to yeah. capitulate to the requirements of the student body but capitulate exactly the way the student body no matter how contradictory their demands yeah. wanted right they want the mediator they want the arbitrator yeah. right to they be want able... the system that they paid for to do what they want it to do well and to deal with all of their problems and it's yeah. like no no you need to deal with your problems yourself if you get into a shoving mm. match on the playground just shove the guy back yeah. right yeah uh, maybe take a punch right get up dust mm. yourself off call him a duty head get over it yeah yeah like I, I just and we've we've gone to this sort of extreme, you know, bubble wrapped kids raised by helicopter parents thing, and I think that that's what's leading to a lot it's of it's perpetuating this. to that, yeah. Hmm. And it's not so. I, I just I wonder if there's a connection between what you just described and the tribalism and the protesting that's happening at colleges now. Um, I wonder if like because uh, because because of the lack of uh, self-regulated behavior, uh, young people are now glomming onto group authority because they can't have the administration do it. So they form a super group, a tribal group, and they say, well, I can't really make my own decisions, but, but together in our intersectional web work of, uh, of uh, marginalized uh, hierarchy, like then this is this is what's gonna control my behavior now. I, I still I need I need outside control. I need to be in the group. I need to protest against this. I don't know. I, I don't think I don't think it's about them asking the group to regulate their behavior or to control their behavior. I think it's actually mm. uh, banding together with a group that will allow them to behave however they want and okay. will justify huh. whatever behavior they engage in. Right. I mean, yeah. this is this is really the thing is, I mean, you, you huh. see this, you see this on both sides of the political divide. And yeah. I see it all the time. Right. Is that the the right criticizes the left of something right of, of engaging in some tactic. And then the right goes and uses the exact same tactic and vice versa. Right. Yeah. Um, doxing is a perfect example. Um, yeah. And I will say that right now, the political right is less likely to be engaging in these sort of underhanded tactics that everybody, you know, all things being equal and without any context applied, everybody would agree that doxing is wrong, you know, except we're going to make exceptions in cases of our group, right? And mm-hmm. I do think that the left has been, uh, has been engaging in those kinds of tactics more than the right has, but I think that it has more to do with um, the perceived position of power that the left has, right? And therefore, mm-hmm. they can do it with impunity. Yeah, they're Whereas, the underdog. Yeah. yeah. Well, they they are not the underdog. They are actually, no, they're not. They're in power, <laughs> right? They have portrayed themselves as the underdog, but they are the ones who are in power. And so they, because they have the power to control the narrative, and the narrative is that they are the underdogs, they can project themselves as having justification for doing those things, yeah. whereas the right does not have the same... It's it's the same thing as making a false allegation of rape, right? Mm-hmm. This is going to be more common among women than men, simply because when men make an allegation of rape, they get laughed at, right? You know, yeah. and so I mean, it's just not effective for them, right? Yeah. If ever there came a day when it became as effective as it is for women to do that, um, for men to do that, uh, hmm. you might see those People numbers evening out yeah. right but i mean so essentially what, what you have is is group affiliation is 100 percent necessary i think it uh, for our psyches okay um it doesn't always have to be along the lines of ideology sometimes it is about race sometimes it is about you know mm. uh i guess sexual orientation or something like that yeah. um 
or green eyed people or gingers or, or yeah. whatever, right? Um, or people with a certain disease, right? Wanting to get together and share their shared experiences yeah. and things like that. Um, but what you ideologies harness that, and uh, sometimes they harness them for good things, and sometimes they harness them for bad things. And right now, I don't. I think that the ideologies and the the tribal affiliations in going on at Evergreen are not mm. about are not about people wanting to belong to a group who will who will regulate their behavior but they're about mm. belonging to a group that will justify whatever they do mm. right and that will that will not only say that it's acceptable but that it's virtuous to yeah. behave in these these atrocious ways right yeah so that that's i think what's feeding that mm. so I just, uh, you know, I criticize and I criticize, but I don't want to just turn into a critic. Like I was like, have to train myself like, well, what's the solution? What's a better option? How do we go forward? How can I give them uh, another chance? You know, how do I, how do I say, okay, you guys are fucking up. Uh, let's go in a different direction. Um, I, so. I myself, for myself, I don't, I do not put forth solutions. That's. Uh, do you think I'm, it's hubri hubristic to think that one can solve or propo propose propose sol solutions? No, I don't. I don't. Such problems? Well, I think it's often out of hubris that people do that, um, but I don't right. think it's inherently hubristic. Um, yeah. But for me, uh, it was years ago I made this decision. Was that I? Huh. Uh, I had to detach myself from. Uh, a kind of vision of what I want society to be like, right? Okay. I, I had to completely detach myself from that in order to be able to continue huh. to look at evidence objectively. Because okay. the moment that, like, because hmm. I, I had found myself wanting to disregard evidence that got in the way of what I wanted. Okay. And, um, and I was, hmm. I was finding myself you know, sort of thinking of the goal as more important than the truth, mm. right? So now it's, and it's not that I am, a, I wouldn't call myself necessarily a critic. I am somebody who wants to understand how people work. Yeah. And, um, and mm. what motivates us and what are the pitfalls that our makeup, yeah. you know, lead us to. And hmm. try and warn people away from those. And so, I mean, like, if, yes, there are some goals. I mean, I would certainly love to have the Duluth model of domestic violence removed from public policy, you know, okay. that, that yeah. feminist model. Um, I would certainly like to have male victims of sexual assault more recognized within the public discourse and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. But there's, as, as far as, a, like, a broad vision, like, even how do we get there? The only thing that I can think of as to how we can get there uh, mm. is just trying to educate people and trying to trying to let them know what their biases are and how human beings operate and and mm -hmm. you know including myself, including everybody, um, yeah. and uh, and then just mm. let other people um, go from there and try and take what they've learned and. Yeah, and go forward. So, it's like I I'm not a prescriptive person. I'm a de okay. descriptive person. I don't know if okay. you have solutions though. I have questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the. Issue. And I have stories. I mean, I just I think I think of it in terms of how how is this story going to operate when everybody believes in this story? Like I, I see things. I see human beings. We gravitate towards narratives. We've we've kind of uh, desaturated religion from our society, but it, religiosity is still there. We still get all in this, we oh, all yeah. start believing in, in one sort of, of thinking. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, what is that thinking <clears throat> going to produce? How, what, what's this other thinking going to produce? What's this other thinking going to produce? So mm -hmm. I don't have any solutions, but, um, I'm always looking for alternatives, I guess. Mm. So alternatives would be good. I think, I think if we could get sort of undermine the 
undermine the current narratives. And part yeah. of that is part of that is exposing the ugliest side of yeah of okay. the results of that, um, which is what you're doing largely mm. by showing footage of some really egregious things that happened at your college and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and then giving your like what I like about your channel, like what you do is you 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 pick apart the language and how they put things and everything else, and you, mm. I mean, it's not like you're reading between the lines a, a bunch of stuff that doesn't actually exist you're you're actually mm. you're actually psychoanalyzing the way they often you know express themselves in a way that i think is actually quite um mm. it's insightful it's intuitive but it's not um it's not overextending that mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. And then hmm. on top of that, it's, you know, you have access to stuff or you have gained access to stuff and you've, you're motivated enough to gain access to stuff that other people mm -hmm. really uh, wouldn't necessarily be bothered to do and, mm -hmm. and expose that. And that's why I wanted to actually interview you is to get more views on your channel. And I would suggest mm -hmm. that people start with that initial video where you talk about please and thank you and why you teach <laughs> children to say that. Because... Yeah. That was that was a beautiful allegory for for huh. so much for theory of mind and the understanding of other individuals as human yeah. beings who have their own their own being in and of themselves and and so you have to be respectful of that and that please and thank you isn't just about some kind of automated etiquette it really is about respecting other people as human beings yeah. and recognition. Yeah, and so I thought that that was that was just absolutely splendid. And a lot of your stuff, you just kind of take something and then you expand <laughs> on it. It's beautiful. So I wanted to get you more views. I absolutely wanted to get you more views. <laughs> well, and, I hope I uh, get ten out of this conversation. Oh, you're gonna get you're gonna get more. You're gonna get more. But um, oh. but yeah, I just uh, did. You actually get to talk to James Damore? No, I haven't spoken with him. Oh, okay. Is he is he is he still on the the YouTube circuit? Um, I see he's, he's very active on Twitter. I'm I'm sure you'd be able to if you wanted to DM him, you'd be able to get an interview with him. You'd be able right. to, you know, just an informal if you were if you were interested or curious. I mean, like he answered my I think we reached out to him through LinkedIn and uh um cuz I didn't know any other way to get a hold of him other than his LinkedIn profile. And yeah. uh, so my guy reached out to him on my behalf and, and he answered me way, you know, after all of the other big time people, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, Tucker yeah, yeah. Carlson and, you know, Stefan Molyneux and Jordan Peterson and all of these people had had, had their way with him. And he's yeah. like, okay, you can have my sloppy fourths or fifths. But, yeah, ouch. Yeah. but it was, no, it was actually a really, it was a fun conversation. And, uh, um, but yeah, no, I, I bet you you guys could have an interesting conversation. I'll, um, I'll, I'll put him on my list then. I'll yeah, you know, because he's he's just the most. You know, if you could if you could think of a man who is less imposing, right? Like l less of a dick, less of a yeah. jerk, you know, less of a arrogant bastard misogynist right yeah. you know i i don't think you'd find anyone less those things than james <sighs> damore and uh so yeah i think he i think he get he needs all the exposure he can get to and yeah. his memo and all of that so yeah that's fascinating stuff thanks for thanks for chatting with me that you've you've helped me to expand my mind um well, I, I, and I love women. I just want to say that because I said I was anti-feminist, but I love I love women. I, I don't think, think life would I would have never gotten here, and I probably wouldn't have stuck around if it weren't for women. Dog, so, dog. I just want to put that out there. Dog, shh. Sorry, my dog's going nuts right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, she's she wants to come out of her nap time, and yeah. It's, but um, no, 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 nobody. I don't think anybody who watches my channel would think that. Anything that you say or have said on this means you're a misogynist. Um, if you are, then I guess I'm also chief executive 
misogynist and rape apologist of Patriarchy Inc. Oh yeah. And wow. uh, yeah, no, I I just I I myself am fond of women. Am I am I a connoisseur hence your, hence your... of women occasionally? But um, <laughs> you know, uh, no, I just uh, it, it, I. This is about ideology. This isn't about identity, right? And mm, so for mm, me, this mm. is all about the the theories. And it, one of the most interesting things about what I do is the moment I say I don't believe men have been monsters through history, all of the feminists tell me you just hate women. It's it, those are the two choices. Apparently. <laughs> Apparently, if I don't if I don't agree that men have been monsters throughout history, that means that I hate women. So, huh. um, and then they say, "But we don't hate men," and it's like, yeah. But if 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 me not condemning men to this role of being uniquely monstrous throughout history um, means that I hate women. Right. How can you say that that yeah. means that you view men in any kind of anything other than a very dim view? Right. So, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting. Yeah. It, yeah. The, the, the weird thing is that maybe we should bring back hypocrisy as something bad. To exhibit. <laughs> maybe. It, that might be something we need to bring back it might just be. as a litmus test. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, I know I, I we're all guilty of it. Oh, of um, course. But, the, but there's certain included. sorts of patterns that are like uh, maybe we should reduce that a little yeah. bit um yeah, maybe think things so. would be better all around all right well thank you so much you look like you're getting exhausted um, i really I'm, need to yeah and i'm losing the light i want anyways, a cigarette because so. you've had 10 and i've, what? I've had none well, you, you know? okay but you need to like <laughs> smoke in your home why are you no i look it's so home? small and, and it's cold i don't want to open a window i should um, get one of those vape those vape machines oh yeah i tried them they hurt my throat but, yeah, yeah. But uh, I might, I might try them again one day. I don't know, but I, I really like my cigarettes. All right, you go have right, a Karen. cigarette. Holy crap! <laughs> it lasted a long time. And yeah. uh, thanks for coming on. And, uh, and I will uh, upload this tonight or tomorrow, and uh, I will send people your way. Thanks so much, Karen. No worries. You too. Have a good night. Bye bye. Bye.